On this channel, we've ranked games, we've ranked franchises, we've ranked quests, we've ranked characters. However, that is no longer enough for us. We've gone mad with ranking power to the point that we are now ranking entire years. If you aren't careful, we'll rank you next. Yes, today we are ranking every single year in the entire history of video games. We're starting with 1972 and we just closed out 2022, making for exactly 50 years. So clearly it's our destiny to make this list at this very moment. Also, it's your destiny to watch it. We're in this together. We will more fully discuss 1972 when we get to that entry, but for now, all you need to know is that nailing down a definitive starting point for gaming is almost impossible. There isn't even an agreement on what counts as the first video game, let alone the year. For instance, the phrase, the first video game, used to be applied to Space War, developed in 1962 by Steve Russell and several others. Then Tennis for Two, designed by William Higginbottom in 1958 started getting the attention. Even earlier though, OXO was created by A.S. Douglas in 1952, and Alan Turing and David Champernown wrote the code for a chess game called Turo Champ in 1948 before any computer could even run it. We could say that gaming started in any of those years, but then we'd end up covering a lot of completely empty years during which nothing happened in the industry whatsoever, leaving us with a lot of very boring entries or just strange gaps in the list. Starting with 1972, however, ensures that every year on this list contains at least one notable development. Speaking of years, we'll be speaking of years for the entirety of this list, but you get the idea. We'll do our best when it comes to release dates. We've done our research and deferred to whichever source we felt was most likely to be correct, but we still had to make a few judgement calls. Also, we've gone with the earliest release dates, which means that if something came out in 1996 in Japan, but not until 1997 in the West, we're covering it in our 1996 entry. After all, we aren't ranking these years in terms of how good they were for one specific country, we're ranking them in terms of what happened overall, and it'd be rather strange to talk about the history of video games and disregard what was happening in Japan. How exactly are we ranking these years, you ask? Well, we created a formula to help us track the high points and low points of the industry from 1972 through to today. Well, through to when we finished writing this script. On the negative side of the ledger, we considered major console and software flops, scandals, tragedies, and games that had an average critical reception of 30% or lower. On the positive side of things, we looked at important hardware, landmark games, non-game developments that changed the industry, and games with an average critical reception of 90% or higher. We also took into account the total video game revenue for each year. We're not financial experts, don't loan us any money because we will waste it, so we deferred to Pelham Smithers Associates, who had the most complete and comprehensive data. That's about it for the rules, but we do have some notes for you to keep in mind as you watch. We know that you won't keep them in mind and then just yell at us in the comments because you skipped this part, but you know, you can't fault us for trying, right? First, as usual, we are focusing on the original release of games rather than ports or remasters. There's really no other option unless you want to hear about Doom, Resident Evil 4 and Skyrim in every entry. Second, we are going to try to keep things as light as possible. We are well aware of the mass shootings, murders and other atrocities that get blamed on or are related in some way to video games. We took these and many other awful things into account. In our actual entries though, we are going to try to keep discussion of real world horrors to an absolute minimum. Finally, we simply cannot discuss everything that happened in any given year. We tried to cover as much as we could, but many things will end up being left out simply because we have other things to talk about. We took all major events and releases into account, don't worry, but if we discussed all of them, this list would take 50 years to watch. Actually, wait, 50 years? Now that I think about it, if we're counting both 1972 and 2022, that's not 50 years, that's 51 years. False alarm, everyone, sorry, I suppose it's not destiny that we're making this list today of all days. But, you know, we've done the intro now, so we might as well keep going. Let's rank them. I'm Ben. And I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and this is Every Year in Video Gaming, ranked from worst to best. Number 51, 1994. 
Right, we're starting with a placement that surprised us as well, and certainly when you're detaching your personal feelings from things and just seeing where the metrics take you, you can end up in some very unexpected places. Sometimes a lot of really great games happen to release in a year that is otherwise not notable. Sometimes a lot of really bad ones release in a year that you remember fondly, and sometimes Sega shoots itself in both feet and both hands and then blindfolds itself and walks directly into traffic. We're not sure Sega had a strategy in 1994 beyond do whatever Nintendo isn't doing. Sadly for Sega, what Nintendo wasn't doing was launching a bunch of high-profile flops in the same year. The Sega Channel, the 32X, and the Saturn were all, to be as polite as possible, ahead of their time. The more honest explanation is that they were ahead of anyone's interest, and this marked the start of the company's decline. They weren't out of the hardware conversation just yet, but they were certainly on the way down. At the time, that was a major blow to gaming in general. This was also the year of a number of games that are commonly spoken of as being among the absolute worst. Shaq Fu, Hotel Mario, and Zelda's Adventure. Admittedly, we found it difficult to find definitive proof of the release date for Zelda's Adventure, as though all documentation of its creation has self-destructed in order to protect us, but it certainly feels like it belongs in the worst-ranked year, doesn't it? 1994 also has one of our earliest games with an average review score of 30% or less. Dreamweb. We here at Triple Jump Towers have thoroughly failed to make any sense out of this one, which evidently sought to combine the story of Highlander with a parable about the seven deadly sins, in the form of a graphical adventure with digitized nudity. It's possible that Dreamweb is a misunderstood masterpiece. It's also possible that we live in the dream of a sleeping baby, though, so it's probably not worth worrying about. No year is all bad, of course. Humble beginnings were laid for future successes in the form of The Elder Scrolls Arena, Kingsfield, and XCOM UFO Defense. Existing genres were brought to new heights, with Tekken, Donkey Kong Country, Super Metroid, and Mother 2, or Earthbound if you want to get 99 95 in the West about this. Oh, and something called the PlayStation launched at the very end of the year in Japan. That might be worth keeping an eye on. Fortunately for it and everyone else, better years are ahead. Number 50, 1979. Where does an industry go after a worldwide hit like Space Invaders? In 1979, one year after that game's release, there was no clear answer to that question. Its popularity alone seemed to change the landscape, and more companies than ever wanted a chance to demonstrate their own creativity and innovation to appreciative audiences who all right, let's not put on airs, more companies than ever wanted money and saw video games as a method for making it, but few of them actually knew how to do that. Near the bottom of the pile, perhaps surprisingly, was Nintendo, whose radar scope flopped hard, shifting only around one third of its measly stock. The company had only recently entered the video game scene, and already it seemed as though they didn't have a clue what made games popular in the first place. In fact, radar scope is the earliest big flop we have on our entire list, but don't worry, the game will be back better and completely unrecognisable in a couple of years. On the subject of games that would return in better form, Sega gave the world head-on in 1979. Namco then realised that that game would have been much better with fruit and gave us Pac-Man a year later, and we'll certainly get to that one. Speaking of Namco, we also got Galaxian, which was essentially a flashier take on Space Invaders and which would eventually return to arcades in sort of remake, sort of sequel, Galaga. All of which means that a lot of place setting was happening in 1979, but there was very little forward momentum. The Microvision released, at last. That's usually thought of as the first handheld console with interchangeable cartridges, but the cartridges themselves housed the games. The Microvision itself was basically a shell that did little on its own. Still, it was the earliest proper attempt at making handheld gaming a thing, so kudos for that. The most important game of the year was probably Asteroids, which was sort of all right. Players use a tiny spaceship to blast away at hulking space rocks. The asteroids each break several times into smaller pieces, making the screen more crowded and allowing players to manage their own difficulty to an extent. It was a success, certainly, and it's every bit deserving of love, but after Space Invaders, just about anything would have felt like a step down. Number 49, 1991. With the impressive debut of new hardware the previous year, 1991 more or less coasted on the quality of its games. And with the year's low placement on this list, those games must represent one big pile of shovelware. shovelware. And indeed, just look at all of these stinkers. The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, Super Castlevania 4, Final Fantasy 4, Road Rash. Wait, those are... Those are all really good. Okay, well it must have been PC games that were dragging them down then. Let's take a look at some of the absolute plops that people were stuck with there. Hmm, Lemmings, Another World, Neverwinter Nights, Civilization. 
Ah, uh, right. Well, I'm sure the arcades were struggling then. Wait, Street Fighter 2? Why on earth is this year ranking so low? Well, 1991 had a lot of truly excellent revolutionary games, but it was dragged down by a number of high-profile misfires. In terms of software, the crowning turd in the water pipe was Action 52, a legendarily awful NES game that retailed for $200. That's around $424.51 today. Think of all the unfortunate children who saved their allowance for literal months just to buy one of mankind's greatest atrocities. Then there was a pair of CD-based consoles that were crapped out to mass derision at the very end of the year, Sega's Mega CD and Philips CDI. Seriously, if you had both just waited a few weeks, 1991 could have soared so high. Granted, it's a bit tough to nail down the singular release date for the CDI, commercial versions existed prior to this, but as far as we can tell, the first consumer versions were released in 1991. Now imagine the poor kid who got burned by Action 52 and then decided that CD technology must have been where the real fun was, so they saved up for a CDI next. Whoever they were, I hope Interpol is keeping a very close watch on them. One of the major positives for the year was the debut of Sonic the Hedgehog, appearing in a game that was like 60% good? For him, that represents a massive success. Sonic promised gamers around the world that Sega was here to stay. He then very quickly tripped on his own shoelaces and knocked all of his teeth out, but still, good start. We're putting the blue blur in this year's positives column, but if you'd prefer to think of it as a negative that one of gaming's most enduring punchlines made his debut here, well, I can't blame you. Number 48, 1973. If you were a video game fan in 1973, you were probably quite bored. Fortunately, you weren't a video game fan in 1973 because the industry as we know it had only been around since the previous year, and also you probably weren't born yet. In fact, 1973 is the only year on our entire list for which we couldn't name a single landmark game. Games came out, yes, but nothing of any real importance, and certainly nothing that rivaled the significance of the previous year's Pong. In fact, Midway released Winner, which was basically Pong. Williams released Paddleball, which was basically Pong, and Atari released Pong Doubles, which was basically Pong, but with a little extra Pong in the middle as a treat. If you played an arcade game in 1973, you were very likely playing some variation of Pong, which is understandable. Nobody can look at two paddles hitting a ball back and forth and immediately think, I know, I'll make Uncharted. It takes time for ideas to evolve, and impressively, they'd evolve rather quickly. For now, though, this was a year during which Pong was no longer a novelty, but nobody had yet decided what would come next. Atari's Space Race also released this year. To clear up one misconception, this is often referred to as the first racing video game, which would indeed be innovative, but we don't think that's an entirely accurate claim. It's quite clearly not in line with what we'd expect a racing game to be, meaning that its influence isn't as large as it might seem at first, and the Magnavox Odyssey already had Wipeout the year before. Oh, Atari also released Gotcha, in which one player pursued another through a constantly shifting room. It was, so far as we can tell, the the very first overhead maze game, which would eventually give rise to the immortal Pac-Man. Being 1973, it wasn't entirely clear what the game was meant to be about, but the advertising flyers implied that it was about a man chasing a woman and attempting to corner her. I'm probably reading too much into that, of course. Then again, players controlled the game by manipulating two pink rubber breasts on the front of the console, so no, I'm not reading too much into that. The game is just disgusting. Well done, gotcha! You're the earliest game on our list to fill us with utter revulsion. Onwards and upwards. Number. 47. 1983. Yes, it's the year of the video game crash. Like Icarus, Atari flew too close to the sun, and by that I mean that Atari manufactured more copies of their games than there were consoles to play them and then wondered why they had so many left over. Come to think of it, that's nothing like Icarus. The boy was stupid, but not that stupid. The games themselves, namely E.T. the Extraterrestrial and the Atari 2600 port of Pac-Man, were released in 1982, but Atari didn't truly feel the pinch of the unsold stock until the following year and the industry felt it right alongside them. Video games at this point were still viewed as a passing fad by the public at large. Then Atari, the biggest company in the business, had two high-profile flops and everyone took a big step back. Developers became wary of taking risks, players bought fewer games, arcades and other establishments reduced their purchasing, growth didn't just slow down, it tanked. The industry had hit $42 billion in revenue the previous year, but thanks to the video game crash of 1983, revenue wouldn't hit the same amount again until 
1993. It wouldn't exceed that amount until 2000. People today sometimes debate the severity of the crash, claiming that it wasn't as significant as others claim, but when you put it into sheer financial perspective, with things taking anywhere from one to two decades to recover, that is a serious blow. The crash mainly affected North America, yes, but North America represented a massive portion of the market. Nintendo debuted its Famicom this year, but it was reluctant to send the console to the West for exactly this reason. If you ever wondered why the NES had such a slow and tentative rollout outside of Japan, that's why. It wouldn't hit America until the end of 1985. It wouldn't hit Europe until a year after that. It wouldn't hit Australia until 1987. And this was because Nintendo, like every other company, worried that the Western market had already burned itself out. Exporting consoles is expensive. In another timeline, Nintendo kept the Famicom firmly within Japan, leaving the industry-wide recovery on hold for even longer, if it recovered at all. 1983 is now a distant, cautionary tale. Still, we can focus on some of the smaller positives that this year brought us. The original Mario Bros, Manic Miner, Bomberman, Nobunaga's Ambition, Dragon's Lair, all of those games offered exciting glimpses of the future. It just wasn't all that certain, at the time, that there would be a future. Number 46. 1976. 1976 represents the very first time that industry revenue peaked, hitting $25 billion before decreasing again for the next few years. It wouldn't hit these levels again until 1980. On the more positive side of things, 1976 is also the earliest year for which we have identified more than one landmark title, and they couldn't be more different. If anything, that proved that games were starting to chart new territory rather than simply trying to chase each other's successes. One of them marked a turning point for arcade games, and the other marked one for home games. Games. The breakout hit in arcades was a uh, breakout, in which players attempted to clear entire screens of bricks with just a paddle and a ball. It was an addictive high score game that relied on mechanical mastery. It also inspired one of the first book length works of game criticism, Pilgrim in the Micro World. It wouldn't come out until 1979, but the fact that Breakout inspired critical analysis at all speaks volumes. Well, one volume. On the home gaming side of things, we got Colossal Cave Adventure, which inspired video games beyond number and set a new standard for depth. Unlike most games up to this point, which focused on a single screen or a repeating gameplay loop, Colossal Cave Adventure offered variety at every turn, puzzles to solve, and a text parser which was marginally more cooperative than an angry cat. Still, it sparked the imaginations of many fans who would go on to develop titles of their own, and references to it are still working their way into games released today. Another interesting development was Sega releasing Road Race, which in turn was re-released in the same year in motorcycle-themed variants. One of these was Fonz, a tie-in to American sitcom Happy Days. This was one of the very first licensed video games, and it offered firm assurance that they would always be terrible. On the subject of driving games, Death Race, a game in which players plowed over little human characters, sparked what is probably gaming's first controversy over violence. We also got Nürburgring 1, which was, as far as we can tell, the earliest driving game from a first-person perspective. Atari then ripped it off the same year and called it Night Driver, which is much less obscure. I suppose after four years of Pong being cloned, Atari decided to start practicing theft as opposed to experiencing it. We understand where you're coming from, Atari, but that doesn't make it right. Number 45. 1978. When it comes to video games, it can be argued that a number of notable things happened in 1978. It can just as easily be argued that only one notable thing happened, but it was one of the most notable things that would ever happen. On the less invasive side of things, Video Magazine debuted Arcade Alley, the first recurring video game column in a non-trade publication. This was the start of modern games journalism, and it's all been downhill from there. We also saw the arcade debut of two companies that would eventually become titans. Konami released Block Game, about which little information survives. Depending on the source, it was either a breakout clone or a Domino's game. Nintendo released Computer Othello. Little information about that survives as well, but at least we know it was, you know, Othello. But you don't care about that. Nobody cared about that. All anybody cared about was Space Invaders. Taito's Space Invaders was the most important thing to happen to video games yet, and at the time it seemed like the game towards which the entire industry had been building. 
Space Invaders was insanely popular, becoming the highest grossing game in Japan, the US and the UK by the following year. It also marked the very start of what we now call the golden age of arcades. In one way, it was a simple score attack game, but everything about it gripped players in ways they'd not previously experienced. The primitive soundtrack increased in tempo as the game progressed, providing a real sense of rising tension. The game sped up as more aliens were shot, a limitation of the programming that accidentally created the difficulty curve. And the the sprite work on the aliens was immediately iconic in a way that almost no other game had even attempted to be. These weren't just things to shoot, these were identifiable and memorable enemies, and everyone wanted to be the one who'd managed to blast them all out of the sky. Space Invaders was a cultural phenomenon, and it pushed the medium forwards in a way that few games have ever managed to do. It wasn't just better than the other games available, it was evidence that this young art form had so much capacity to surprise and inspire, and that's not exaggeration, it's been cited by Shigeru Miyamoto and Hideo Kojima as being one of their earliest inspirations. Space Invaders wasn't just a fun way to spend a few coins, it was the promise of excellent games for decades to come. Number 44 1993 1993 suffers largely from the fallout of a pair of video games released in 1992. How's that for unfair? We won't hear about 1992 for a while because that was a great year that didn't have to face the consequences of its own actions, sort of like Saturday Night Me with a belly full of dominoes. That's a problem for Sunday Morning Me to deal with. Sucks to be that guy. Thanks to those two games, this year saw the start of the United States Senate hearings on video game violence. Those would eventually give rise to the ESRB, a ratings board for American releases and other regions around the world would establish similar practices of their own. That in itself is not a bad thing at all. Grandma probably feels a bit better knowing she won't buy little Timmy a game full of exploding heads for his 10th birthday, for instance, and content warnings help us understand what we're getting ourselves into when we pick up a new game ourselves. The problem was that this marked an official start to an era in which video games continued to be blamed for horrific acts that certainly have different root causes, with those causes remaining completely unaddressed. From mental health issues to easily procured deadly weapons, focusing society's ire on video game violence prevents us from having discussions about actual problems and finding solutions that might, you know, work. I myself have played Mortal Kombat, for instance, and I've ripped out no more than three or four spines in my entire life. It's clearly not the games. Interestingly, while 1993 will be remembered for vilifying video games and gamers, it was also full of releases that expanded minds, demonstrated great creativity and moved the medium significantly forwards as an art form. Myst, The Seventh Guest and The Secret of Mana all built fascinating universes and explored them in surprising new ways. NBA Jam, Virtua Fighter and Star Fox took well-established genres and launched them to new levels of excitement and engagement. Day of the Tentacle set a new standard for writing and voice acting in graphical adventure games. Mega Man X took standard platformer conventions and placed them into a larger, more explorable framework full of hidden goodies and upgrades. All of these represented huge steps forward, not just in terms of spectacle, but in terms of intelligence, imagination, and innovation. And Right, also, yes, there was Doom, but I'm trying not to bolster their argument here. Let's focus on the brainier stuff, right? And not the bits of actual brain that Doom Guy was splattering all over the walls. It was very good, though. Number 43, 2021. COVID-19 shook the world in 2020, but its effects in gaming were even more fully felt in 2021. Nobody knew quite how long the pandemic would affect working conditions, let alone daily life, which left release dates unmet and developers struggling to adjust to what was becoming a more difficult world. It wasn't without highlights, but after several years packed so full of highlights that we couldn't possibly list them all, there's not nearly as much here. Resident Evil Village was probably the closest thing to a universal favourite, taking the action of the Resident Evil 2 remake the atmosphere of Resident Evil 4 and the first-person perspective of Resident Evil 7, and then had a nine-foot-tall woman step on them until they became one. Pac-Man 99 was a fun diversion. It Takes Two was a surprisingly good co-op game. Returnal was an addictive roguelike adventure. Kays and the Wild Masks was a great Donkey Kong Country game, especially since nobody bothers to make Donkey Kong Country anymore. Similarly, Record of Lodos War, Deed Lit in Wonder Labyrinth was a great Castlevania game, especially since nobody bothers to make Castlevania anymore. Also, if you you can explain the title to me, I'll know you're lying. And there was Metroid Dread, which, well, people were happy to have a new Metroid
Metroid game, so they all agreed to pretend that just about every previous Metroid game wasn't much, much better than this. It wasn't the best year for new releases, but it was a rather good year for ports and remakes. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, Sea of Solitude, Director's Cut, Capcom Arcade, Stadium, Odd World, Soulstorm, and many others brought older games back into our homes, which was welcome since we weren't allowed to leave. This goes double for Super Mario 3D World, with the Bowser's Fury bonus game that feels like a glimpse of an open-world Mario game to come. Of course, we aren't counting ports and remakes, so these games aren't doing 2021 any favours overall, but they're worth noting. Bringing down the average were two rightful punching bags. eFootball 2022 was Konami's latest attempt to see if they could make money from a game that wasn't worth playing, and Balan Wonderworld was Yuji Naka's interactive resignation from the games industry. I'm joking, of course. Square Enix wrestled creative control away from the man and then refused to take his name off the game. On the bright side, Yuji, whatever you do next is going to be seen as one hell of a step up. Oh, oh no. Number 42, 1972. This is it, the year that started it all. Sort of, if you really squint, but not really. So, right, we promised you an explanation, and you're going to get one. 1972 was not the first year in which video games existed. That's a fact. It does, however, mark the first year in which video games, as we know them, existed. This is when video games went from being impressive experiments to being, well, an industry. 1972 laid firm groundwork for every year to follow. This was due to two innovations that happened to land in the same year, one in arcades and one in homes. The early emissary of the arcade landscape was none other than Pong. This was not the first arcade game. Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney released Computer Space the previous year. Computer Space, in our opinion, is the better game. It's a more involved experience that relies on players mastering tricky movements to either blast enemy spacecraft or each other, depending depending upon the version of the game. It was impressive, maybe not when compared to Rocket League or something, but when compared to, you know, nothing, it was quite revolutionary. Computer Space, however, was nowhere near the hit that 1972's Pong was. Pong was entirely reaction-based, with controls that were simple to master, which was a better fit for a public that didn't have years of video game experience yet, and which was also probably rather drunk, as the Pong prototype was originally installed in a tavern. Computer Space struggled to sell around 1,500 cabinets, but Pong quickly sold 8,000. Home gamers, not that there had been any prior to 1972, got to experience the very first console, the Magnavox Odyssey. The Odyssey used cartridges that tweaked the system's internal programming, and most of what the Odyssey could do was built right into it. What the Odyssey could do amounted to moving different kinds of digital paddles around, but it was an impressive achievement, and it came with screen overlays and physical materials to make each game feel different. The Odyssey isn't likely to be anybody's favourite console today, but your favourite console, whatever it is, owes it a debt of gratitude. Granted, both of these developments happened in the United States, leaving the rest of the world to play catch-up later, but there was no doubt that revolution was afoot, and five decades down the line, it's impressive just how much of an impact these two innovations had. They were the Adam and Eve of video gaming. eFootball 2022 is Kane, and Balan Wonderworld is Abel. Number 41, 1999. Let's put the good news up front, shall we? Resident Evil 3 Nemesis was the first sign of the series beginning to flag a bit, but it was still good. Also, it arrived in tandem with Silent Hill, which followed in Resident Evil's footsteps with a brainier, more philosophical approach to the horror. What an exciting new series! I'm sure this one will be around forever and ever, and oh, it's back. Tony Hawk's Skateboarding, or Tony Hawk's Pro Skater if you want to get transcontinental about this, set a new precedent for sports games. I know you get mad when we call skateboarding a sport, but other people would get mad if we didn't call it a sport, so go easy on us. Jeez, let me move on to something easier to describe, like Shenmue, which... Right? I've played Shenmue, and I still don't know what it is. Maybe I'll call it a sport too, just to annoy you. Has it worked? We also got great games such as Super Smash Bros, Crazy Taxi, Ape Escape, System Shock 2, and Mario Golf. Look, our writer really loved Mario Golf, and he threatened to quit if we didn't let him include it, so let's politely nod and never speak of it again. Otherwise though, 1999 was very rough. Strictly speaking, the biggest hardware release was the 64DD, an add-on for the Nintendo 64 that Japan never bothered exporting. It was such a flop that they may have considered deporting it instead. There was a small highlight in the form of the Wonder Swan, which was Nintendo's first true competitor in the handheld space, as it managed to grab 8% of the market. That's 
not much, but it's an impressive amount to steal back from Nintendo. When the Wonder Swan qualifies as a hardware highlight, though, you're in rather rocky territory. 1999 was also the year that brought us Superman The New Superman Adventures, better known as Superman 64, which was every terrible tendency of licensed video games rolled into one and then jammed directly into your eye. Most heartbreaking for a certain subset of gamers was Chainsaw Monday, a massive downsizing of Sierra Online that resulted in the abrupt halt, in most cases permanently, of the developer's most popular series, including Quest for Glory, King's Quest, Space Quest, Police Quest, Quest Quest, Chex Quest, Quest of the Delta Knights. Sorry lost the thread a bit there, but you get the idea. The heyday of graphical adventure games had come to an end, and a few modern revivals aside, things have never been quite the same since. When Prince suggested partying like it was 1999, he must not have worked at Sierra. Number 40. 1984. The year between the video game crash and the Western debut of Nintendo's Famicom was a largely quiet one for gamers outside of Japan. A number of developers, particularly in the West, closed their doors and left the industry behind entirely. Many others were extremely reluctant to take risks seeing for the first time how truly fragile success could be. Atari even delayed the release of its 7800 console, which had already been announced on the grounds that they weren't sure the industry would survive long enough to warrant mass production. See, companies have this weird thing in common. They like making money, and they dislike losing it. Super strange. It's certainly nothing I understand or could explain, but it at least provides a reason that developers became, almost overnight, far more selective about where they were willing to invest their resources and release their products. The overriding sentiment was that the industry was waiting to see what happened before they shoveled more money into what might turn out to be a furnace, and the result was a rather quiet year overall. As such, Orwell was right, 1984 isn't a year most of us would choose to live in. Those who were around, however, got at least a few interesting releases to keep them busy. Boulder Dash, Karate Champ, King's Quest, and Punch-Out are mainly notable in retrospect for the number of much better games that they inspired, but they still deserve a bit of credit in their own right. Ditto 1942. The game, not the year. Frankly, if we were including that year in gaming on our list, we'd put it dead last as nothing came out at all. 1984 also saw the release of one of the most popular video games in history, though you'd be forgiven if you didn't notice it. This was Tetris, designed by Alexei Pajitnov and released solely in the USSR for the Electronica 60, a Soviet-manufactured computer. Interestingly, the Electronica 60 wasn't capable of displaying graphics as we know them, and the blocks were made from text characters. Probably should have called it Textrus then, Alexei. <laughs> of course, Tetris wouldn't truly make an impact on the industry until 1989, when Nintendo bundled it with its revolutionary handheld. In 1984, it was just an oddity, and nobody was even sure there'd be an industry at all. Once again, it was a quiet year. Fortunately, 1985 would be much noisier. Number 39. 1975. As with most of the earliest years of the industry, 1975 isn't where you'll find many innovations. Instead, you'll find just a few that end up having a massive impact. Also, as with many of the earliest years of the industry, it was Pong that led the way. Though the game was several years old at this point, and other arcade games were unquestionably more impressive, Pong was still a massive success, and arcades were flooded with imitators. What Atari did in 1975 was, finally, release a version of the game for the home market. Of course, the home market barely existed just yet, and Atari struggled to catch the interest of manufacturers or distributors. Yes, at this early stage, selling hardware to video game fans was a radical concept, and Atari had to rely on Sears to release the first official home Pong console under the Telegames name. Magnavox beat the company into homes with the Odyssey, but Atari making Pong available may have officially cemented the home market as a concept, turning those who enjoyed pumping a few coins into arcade cabinets now and then into lifelong consumers. Elsewhere, other advances were happening around the periphery, with hobbyists learning to program and developing exciting new games of their own. Pedit 5 was what we'd call a dungeon crawler today. It was developed by Rusty Rutherford, making use of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign's computer system, which was an inappropriate use of school resources. The game was deleted repeatedly by administrators, leaving Rutherford to restore it over and over again. DND, sometimes said to have originated in 1974, but it's unclear, was another dungeon crawler, but it is credited with introducing one of gaming's most enduring innovations, boss fights. Oh, and ripping off Dungeons & Dragons, so it introduced two of gaming's most enduring innovations. Another important game was Taito's Western Gun, released as Gunfight in North America, which featured the first person-to-person -person combat between recognisably human characters. It's fair to say that that idea caught on. Also in 1975, the industry hit $15 billion in revenue, more than 
than doubling the previous year, which is a rate of growth that would never happen again. I know that it's easy to dismiss this by saying smaller numbers are easier to double, and that's correct, but the rate of growth was undoubtedly impressive. Also, I don't know, I'd be pretty happy with $15 billion personally, maybe I'm too easy to please. Number 38, 1985. To put the video game crash into sharp perspective, in 1985, industry revenue was the lowest it had been since 1974. You know, when there was almost no industry at all. Things would, however, start to turn around now, and it's all thanks to a little grey box called the Nintendo Entertainment System. Nintendo did not export its Famicom, as the company was no longer comfortable pitching whatever it had into the global market and hoping for the best. Instead, they spent two years refining and reworking the technology into something that they felt would be more actively palatable to Western audiences, and they ensured that the refined system, the NES, would launch with a strong lineup of games, leaving most of the less impressive ones right where they were in Japan. Nintendo essentially pioneered the act of game localization as we know it. Things weren't simply translated, they were tweaked, altered, and sometimes removed entirely. The company understood that it couldn't leave luck to heaven, it had to make an active effort to ensure that its products were in line with what the Western gamers would want. The result? Super Mario Bros, basically. The game had a then unprecedented three-year development cycle, with Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka leading production on what would not only be Nintendo's killer app, but would be the industry's killer app. The game was designed to be more fun, more impressive, longer, deeper, quiet back there, and more memorable than anything that had come out before. That was incredibly cocksure, I said quiet, but miraculously, they succeeded. Super Mario Bros was exactly the shot in the arm that gaming needed, and it immediately sparked a level of competition from other developers and console manufacturers that simply hadn't existed before. Also, Nintendo made literal tons of cash, which they probably liked too. The year and every childhood and most of the money belonged to Nintendo, without question, but there were still worthwhile games coming out of other companies. Konami gave us Gradius, Sega gave us Space Harrier, Atari gave us Paperboy, Capcom gave us Ghosts and Goblins, and all of those are great, but they also seemed pedestrian compared to Super Mario Bros, which felt like exactly what it was, a bridge to a much brighter future for gaming as a whole. Oh, also the Master System came out. Somebody might have bought one, but I haven't actually been able to verify by that fact. Number 37, 1986. 1986 was a fairly quiet year as far as innovations went, but it wouldn't have felt that way. The NES was still fresh and was single-handedly and rapidly revitalizing the Western market. Looking back, it's easy to just glance over the new games and say, yes, they were good, but for gamers at the time, especially young ones, they weren't just good. They were thrilling, they were more varied and exciting than ever before, and every one of them was a little magical portal into entirely new worlds, where everything was made of little squares, yes, but still. 1986 basically coasted on its software, but that software went a long way towards cementing video game systems as household staples. If you didn't own an NES by the end of 1986, it didn't just mean that you had different hobbies, it meant that you were missing out on an entire wave of popular culture. What's more, for the first time since 1982, the year saw an increase in industry revenue rather than a decrease. The industry had not yet recovered, but it was at least recovering. As this was due in large part to the NES, seriously, most of the industry revenue at this point was company revenue for Nintendo, it's no surprise that most of the important games were released for that console. Castlevania, Dragon Quest, Adventure Island, Metroid, and Kid Icarus offered enough of their own to keep gamers busy, but Nintendo had to go and release The Legend of Zelda as well. Boy, that company really doesn't get enough credit for inventing the backlog. Cruel, cruel people. Arcade fans got some nice new toys too, such as Bubble Bobble and Outrun, and PC owners got an early attempt at a comedy heavy game thanks to Space Quest. It was far from the best adventure game that anybody had played, but it was genuinely funny, which was impressive in itself. Also, the sequels were much better, thank goodness. Elsewhere, though, fans of Sega's Master System... Okay, sorry, I tried to say that with a straight face. <clears throat> uh, victims of Sega's Master System were introduced to a character design to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mario and break Nintendo's newfound stranglehold on the industry. I'll give you a hint. He's blue, he has spines, he's a hedgehog, his name is Sonic, and I'm lying because it was actually just Alex Kidd and nobody cared. We already covered Sonic's debut in entry number 49 anyway, you're so easy to fool, I swear. Number 36, 1974. 
Everyone knows rock attained perfection in 1974. It's a scientific fact. But what of video games? Well, the industry crossed $5 billion in revenue for the first time, which is significant, but developers were nowhere near perfecting games. Still, the quality was increasing. For instance, Pong might have been a fair enough approximation of tennis, but Taito's basketball had actual human players in it. Whether or not these are the first humans in video games is debatable. Without question, humans had at least been represented in games by this point, so Taito's real achievement was making them recognisably human. Even then, their arms are three times the length of their legs, and they have heads like toasters, but still. Elsewhere, Speed Race, released under two different names, Racer and Wheels, the following year in North America, looks and plays much like what top-down racing games would become for years to follow. Then there was Space Sim, one of the very first 3D games ever created. Its programmer, Jim Bowery, is well aware of how many other games followed in its footsteps, and in 2001 he even offered a bounty to anyone who could prove the existence of a multiplayer 3D virtual reality game prior to Space Sim. I'd love to collect that bounty by pointing out the existence of 1973's Maze, and it's almost certainly true that Maze preceded Space Sim, but the development timeline of that game is far hazier. Some sources claim that Maze wasn't a proper game until 1974 when it was renamed Maze War. So I'll follow the historian's lead on this and credit both Space Sim and Maze as the parents of modern day first person shooters. Congratulations, your children will grow up to be awful. Both of these games were passion project however and not commercial products, meaning that the one true landmark in 1974 was Atari's Tank, best known today for opening each episode of Cowboy Bebop. It's a very simple game that sees two players engaging in head to head vehicular combat and it's still quite fun which explains why we keep seeing variations on the same idea today. It was a hit for Atari, and it would later inspire some of their most successful home releases as well. In fact, we owe the game our gratitude for firming up Atari's standing in the burgeoning industry ahead of its first console, and helping the company to establish what home gaming would look like moving forwards. In other words, tanks for everything. Number 35. 2022. As years go, 2022 has been somewhat bland. Usually this would be a bad thing, but considering the couple of years that came before, I think we're all just relieved to have had a bit of stability. The game on everyone's lips was of course Elden Ring, the gorgeous open world RPG by From Software that had everyone and their dog vying to become the Elden Lord. If you were one of the five people who weren't playing Elden Ring, it's likely you were instead diving headfirst into one of several hotly anticipated sequels, such as Horizon Forbidden West or God of War Ragnarok, or one of the many, many remasters, ports, or remakes that 2022 sent our way. Not everyone was pleased about all of these rehashings though, and developer Naughty Dog caught a huge amount of flack from the public for remaking The Last of Us, a game which, at the time, was only nine years old and had already been remastered once. Opinions remained divided on whether the improved visuals were worth the $70 price tag. In our writer's opinion, absolutely not. The number of good games released in 2022 was far outweighed by the number of disappointing ones. Despite being hyped into oblivion, players came away feeling shortchanged by everything from the Saints Row reboot to Gotham Knights to Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. On the plus side though, as the world began to go somewhat back to normal, gamers found it much easier to come by hardware that had previously eluded them. The Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 were still selling out almost as quickly as they were being stocked, but certainly towards the end of the year, it became less of an ordeal to get hold of the consoles. There was also good news for PC gamers, who saw the prices of major components like GPUs falling due to the resolution of supply chain issues and declines in the stock and crypto markets. If 2022 was the year of anything though, it was the year of the acquisition. Zynga, the American studio behind Farmville, was bought by Take-Two Interactive for $12.7 billion, and Sony acquired Halo and Destiny developer Bungie for $3.6 billion. Perhaps the biggest rocking of the boat, though, was Microsoft's announcement that they intend to buy recently disgraced company Activision Blizzard. Should the acquisition be approved by international regulators, it will be the largest in video game history, and will grant Microsoft the rights to a plethora of franchises. By this point, we should probably just accept Microsoft as our new overlords and be done with it. Number 34, 1989. 
You know, if 1989 gave rise to nothing other than the Game Boy, it would have still been a pretty important year. It was the first handheld to truly become a worldwide sensation, owing in huge part to all of the lessons Nintendo had learned from localizing its Famicom for the Western market. The company understood that high-quality software was crucial to long-term sales as opposed to a quick financial rush. Nintendo wanted the Game Boy to actually stick around and to become a staple of pockets, just as the NES was now a staple of living rooms. Of course, nobody actually had pockets large enough to hold a Game Boy, but the intention was there, and so were the games, with Tetris single-handedly justifying the purchase. Additionally, Capcom was hitting its stride as well with the release of well, Strider, as well as Final Fight, both of which helped cement the developer as a rising star and which are amongst the best games of the era. Capcom also released DuckTales for the NES, perhaps the first truly great licensed game. As far as I'm concerned, it was also the last. <laughs> oh, I'm on fire today. This was the same year that Konami released Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles if you want to get unreasonably threatened by the word ninja about this. Sega was experimenting with games that might not have paid immediate dividends, but which did prove that the company was more confident in experimenting as time went on. There was Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap, which was a non-linear side-scrolling adventure featuring transformations, RPG elements, and collectibles. There was Herzog's Fi, a real-time strategy game during a time when those were not commonplace, especially on consoles. And there was Phantasy Star 2, which is now considered to be one of the best RPGs of its day. Considering the RPG landscape in 1989, that only says so much, but it is an impressive accolade nonetheless. Computer gamers experienced some seminal titles of their own, including SimCity, Prince of Persia, and Pipe Mania. Yeah, that's right, you once had to pay actual money to own a copy of the hacking minigame that you all hate. These were lawless times. The PC engine took a stab at a mascot of its own, with Bonk's Adventure, known as PC Kid in Europe where we insisted on having the worst name for everything all of the time, though Bonk obviously didn't do for that console what Mario did for the NES, and the age of malformed caveman heroes was short-lived. Maybe that's a good thing, actually. Number 33, 1995. The PlayStation made its Japanese debut at the end of the previous year, but in 1995, Sony made it very, very clear that they weren't just entering the console market out of curiosity. They were coming out swinging. Sadly for Sega, this coincided with the very first E3, during which attendees witnessed a public execution. Roll the clip. $2.99. Yes, Sony deliberately and expertly knocked the legs out from under the Saturn's Western debut by undercutting the price, and the company set its sights on Nintendo next. Of course, theatrics and pricing wars only mean so much. Good hardware needs good software. And though 1995 was far from the PlayStation's best year in that regard, it was still a pretty good one. Suicoden, Wipeout, Rayman, and Twisted Metal were among some of the console's early highlights. The quick success of the PlayStation can't be overstated, and this got the understandable attention of longtime Nintendo developers, who would quickly begin making moves to put their long-running series on Sony hardware instead. In the years to come, Square would move Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest there, Capcom would move Mega Man X, Konami would move Castlevania, and the fewer the games that Nintendo fans could count on getting, the more curious eyes would turn Sony's way. Those, of course, were still developments yet to come, so we aren't counting them here, but the point is that Sony gained a lot of ground with the PlayStation's debut, and that momentum would not slow for a very long time. None of which is to say that Nintendo was showing signs of slowing down just yet. Some of the best games of the year were found on their juggernaut SNES, including Yoshi's Island, Paneled Upon, Terra Nigma, Tales of Fantasia, and Chrono Trigger. Additionally, they launched the Satellaview in Japan, which introduced online gaming and downloadable titles into millions of homes. They also launched the Virtual Boy, however, which introduced glass and red plastic into millions of landfills. Oh, speaking of landfills, Tiger's R-Zone debuted that year as well. <laughs> Boy, people really thought the future would be bright crimson and black, didn't they? 
So yeah, there was great hardware making waves in this year, but also some pretty lousy hardware pulling down the overall average, also including Atari's Jaguar CD, which was essentially the last gasp of what had once been a classic company. Atari didn't die with the Jaguar, but its quality of life was certainly never very high after this point. And that's a little sad, you know? Let's dip back into Atari's glory days for a bit then, shall we? Number 32, 1977. 1977 was a year with a lot of small successes and two major ones. In terms of hardware, this was the year of the Atari 2600. The system allowed games to be fully loaded onto cartridges as opposed to using cartridges to simply manipulate the software of the console itself, as the Odyssey did. This freed up developers to do, well, anything at all, as long as the 2600 could actually run it. The sky was the limit, and the console gave rise to waves of third-party developers who could now make games for the growing industry without having to also create hardware. Not all 2600 games were great, of course, but the system ushered in a new and significant era of creativity. The games also looked far better than anything the Odyssey could have produced, showing how far the technology had advanced in just five years. The other big success was Zork. Zork was heavily inspired by Colossal Cave Adventure, and it similarly inspired hobbyists and massive nerds to dabble in programming for themselves, but it also went on to become one of home gaming's earliest smash success stories. It was an indie darling before there was even an indie scene. It wouldn't see a commercial release until a later version called Zork 1 was brought out by Infocom in 1980, but the game was already making waves through informal distribution networks before then. It even became a series of its own. We certainly got sequels to games released before 1977, but very few of them can be said to have launched entire franchises. Still notable but less immediately influential were the Color TV Game 6, marking Nintendo's earliest dalliance with consoles, though still a tentative one, and the Apple II, which was not designed for games but which would eventually give rise to some truly enduring ones, and which provided budding young developers with their first taste of home computing and programming. This was also the year that Atari co-founder Nolan Bushnell opened the first Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater in San Jose, California. It was a notable event in arcade history, as it provided a dedicated space for fans to visit and experience a vast array of cabinets, as opposed to just finding one or two at various pubs or restaurants. In other words, video games were finally becoming enough of a draw themselves. They no longer had to rely on other things being the main attraction. Then again, pizza and singing mice probably did still help. Number 31, 1997. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Actually, this is neither the first nor last entry on this list, so that's not actually true. Sorry, Dickens. Sorry, shouldn't have brought you into this at all, really. The point is, this was a year in which some really good stuff happened, but some really crap stuff also happened, and so overall, it was kind of a wash. There you go, Charles. That should have been your opening sentence. The odds are good that if you're into classic video games at all, at least one of your favourites either released in 1997 or was a sequel to something released in 1997. GoldenEye 007, Oddworld, Abe's Odyssey, Diablo, Gran Turismo, Klonoa Daughter Phantom Isle, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and Dungeon Keeper were all instant classics, and their reputations have only grown since. Final Fantasy had an especially strong showing, with Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy Tactics both hitting shelves. Also, two legendary franchises got their start here, Grand Theft Auto and Fallout. They'd both get much bigger and better, of course, but each of those games made a huge impact on its own, and it was clear then that they would lead to great things. In both cases, that was correct for the most part. And yet this was also a year of misfortune. Let's all point and laugh at the Gamecom, Tiger's attempt at a handheld to rival the Game Boy, which ended up instead rivaling flesh-eating bacteria for how much anyone wanted it. The reason we're going to point and laugh and get it out of our systems now is that 1997's other tragedies are not deserving of mockery. First is that Gunpei Yokoi was struck and killed by a motorist, resulting 
resulting in an untimely death for one of gaming's earliest visionaries. Yokoi was instrumental to the development of the Game & Watch and Game Boy, and was still actively developing new hardware when he died. The Wonder Swan, his final project, will be released posthumously. The second is that an episode of the Pokemon anime contained flickering visuals that resulted in the hospitalization of almost 700 children in Japan, with some of them remaining there for weeks. Nintendo was not responsible for this, they didn't make the anime, but the company was tied closely enough to the property that their shares dipped significantly, and Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamuchi had to issue a statement that the games did not use the same flashing effects seen in the television show. There was a lot of unfortunate darkness in this year that was otherwise pretty great. Number 30. 1981 Prior to 1981, major advances in gaming had some breathing room. For example, the Odyssey had a five-year head start before the Atari 2600 started kicking it out of homes, Pong had four years of intermittent dominance before Breakout further evolved the arcade experience, and Breakout itself had two years before Space Invaders blew it away, and next, Space Invaders had two years before Pac-Man gobbled it up. But in 1981, the very next year, Donkey Kong barreled its way onto the scene. Gone were the days of slow, small innovations. Things were changing every year from this point forwards, and they were changing in great number. And all because in 1981, everyone fell in love with a gorilla. N not in that way, obviously. Pac-Man stayed on top financially, but attention was turning to Donkey Kong, which introduced well, Donkey Kong, but also Mario, who would go on to essentially define video games well into the 1990s. The fascinating thing is that the entire game was born from misfortune, and therefore both the Donkey Kong and Mario franchises were as well. After Nintendo failed to shift nearly as many radar scoop units as it had manufactured, remember that one? The company tasked Shigeru Miyamoto and Gunpei Yokoi with creating a better game that could run on the same hardware. The idea was that unsold radar scope units would be reconfigured to run whatever the two young men created, and maybe then the company could make its money back. Had they failed, Nintendo might have pulled out of video games altogether. They did not fail, of course, and both men became industry superstars in their own right in years to come. All anybody knew at the time, however, was that Donkey Kong was the new king, and he was more than happy to collect the world's tribute in the form of pocket change. This was not the only important debut, though it certainly was the most momentous one. Other important new series included Ultima, Wizardry, and Castle Wolfenstein. And there were more high-profile hits as well, including Frogger, Galaga, Tempest, and Defender, which was so popular that it got a sequel, Stargate, in the very same year. Things were picking up speed in 1981, and notably so. The technology was still primitive, but with the introduction of so many enduring classics and new series, things were finally starting to look a lot more like what we'd recognize today. Number 29, 1988. Because the PC gaming market is more dispersed, it's sometimes tough to look at one year and see innovation after innovation landing in quick succession the way we'd often see in arcades or on consoles. But 1988 saw a pair of major titles from Interplay that are worth taking note of. There was Battle Chess, which was an early word-of-mouth hit that introduced a new generation of fans to chess in general, removing the abstraction from the game and replacing it with well-animated cartoon violence, just as God intended. Then there was Wasteland a post-apocalyptic RPG with pitch-black humour, punishing difficulty, and a harrowing look at familiar locations raised by nuclear war. We'd end up revisiting similar ideas to even better effect in the company's later series, Fallout. And of course, Nintendo was riding high. To give you some idea of just how high, the company debuted Nintendo Power, a long-running magazine that contained hints, tips, previews, cheat codes, and reviews, which wouldn't be notable aside from the fact that subscribers were basically paying to receive video game advertisements. 
That was one hell of a trick on Nintendo's part, and not one that any other company really managed to pull off again. Really, it was Nintendo's fans who were best served in 1988. Ninja Gaiden made its debut in arcades and on the NES in the same year, showing that developers realized the importance and profitability of covering both bases. Mega Man 2 set a new standard for action games, and it did so by basically being Mega Man 1 again, only good. Also, we got a great sequel to Super Mario Bros, but it wouldn't have been the same sequel for everybody. In the West, it was the reworked version of Super Mario Bros 2, and in Japan it was the smash hit Super Mario Bros 3. By this point, the portly plumber was officially gaming's brightest star. But was that about to change? Maybe, because with the release of the Mega Drive, Sega was finally ready to bring its real mascots into homes. Yes, you waited patiently for him, and now he's arrived at last, at full speed, the one true rival that would shake Nintendo, Altered Beast, the beast which is altered. Yeah, Sega's strategy of calling everything a mascot and hoping for the best wasn't really working. The Mega Drive was here and it was impressive, but it wasn't a smash hit out of the gates, and as I've now demonstrated, Sonic certainly took his sweet time showing up. I thought he was supposed to be quick, that guy. What a fraud. Number 28, 1982. 1982 was a year of major debuts and a pair of high-profile sequels, continuing the industry's upward trajectory, though the seeds of the following year's video game crash were sowed here. Obviously, we've already discussed that in the entry for 1983, a year which itself probably deserves to be buried in the desert, but it's worth noting that the cracks were starting to show here, however strong 1982 might have been otherwise. And it was indeed strong otherwise. Atari launched the 5200, which fell massively short at the 2600 sales, but which brought newer technology to consoles and cemented the company, for the time being, as the standard for home gaming. The ColecoVision made its debut, and though it didn't loosen Atari's grasp, it did become a classic console in its own right. It even launched with a pack-in version of Donkey Kong, which looked great for the time and was a major selling point. Arcades saw the debut of huge games such as Jungle King, though it was quickly renamed Jungle Hunt to avoid legal entanglements with Tarzan. For a man raised by apes, he certainly is litigious. There was also Dig Dug, Burger Time, Pole Position, and Cubert, which is one hell of a strong lineup of unique ideas. Gamers had more variety than ever, and as we now know, things were really just getting started. We got sequels to popular games as well, such as Donkey Kong Jr., Miss Pac-Man, and probably some other games that didn't rely on exploring the family trees of established characters, but who wants to play those? Seriously, we were probably this close to getting a game about Froggers and Home gamers were blessed with Pitfall. It wasn't David Crane's first game, but it was definitely the one that positioned him as one of the industry's earliest superstars. Pitfall was easily the most impressive platformer yet released, and it provided a sense of exploration that was unrivaled on consoles up to that point. It looks a bit primitive today, yes, but its influence was massive. Speaking of massive, Koei released what might be the first Aroge game, Nightlife, inventing an exciting new genre. The game featured explicit images of... Right, sorry, I've just read the rest of this sentence and I'm not comfortable saying any of it out loud, so let's wrap this up. The point is, things were riding high in 1982, and it's just a shame that it was followed by 1983. Number 27, 1987. It will come as no surprise to hear that Nintendo was still dominating the home market in 1987, but we should at least spend some time acknowledging just how great a year it was for arcade games. That, after all, was an area in which Nintendo had far less of a presence, and other companies could develop their own identities with interesting and influential releases that didn't have to fit on a dinky little NES cartridge. Sega, for instance, was still unsuccessful at getting anyone on Earth to buy a Master System, but the company did continue to crank out arcade hits such as Shinobi and Afterburner. Konami set the bar for co-op games with Contra and Double Dragon, and Capcom released Street Fighter but it was the crap Street Fighter, so let's check back in later for the sequel. PC games as well were striking out in impressive new directions, particularly in the field of graphical adventure games. 
Maniac Mansion was a brilliant horror comedy that literally no human being ever finished without a hint book. Police Quest offered a striking innovation of its own by not being any fun, and Leisure Suit Larry in the Land of the Lounge Lizards innovated in ways that we can't discuss if we want to keep this video monetized. 1987 also saw the debut of the PC Engine, or TurboGrafx-16 if you want to get Simon Miller photoshopped into a 1980s wardrobe about this, though it wouldn't hit the West until 1989. And when it did, it wasn't all that much of a hit. Still, it was very impressive hardware for the time, and it had a pretty decent library of games as well, earning it a dedicated following that exists to this day. It couldn't hold a candle to the NES in terms of sales, but at this point in time, literally nothing could. Because yes, the NES continued to offer the best games of the era. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out was perhaps the first celebrity licensed game worth playing, and Final Fantasy was… I mean it was Final Fantasy, wasn't it? Anyone who hears those two words will know immediately how important they are. Add to those a litany of strong sequels, Zelda 2, Castlevania 2, and Dragon Quest 2 too, I mean also, and that was still just the tip of the iceberg. It was Nintendo's last truly unchallenged year at the top, but they absolutely made the most of it. Number 26, 2013. God, 2013 had some great stuff. So many excellent releases, in fact, that I can feel my icy heart melting. Is, is this what scientists call happiness? 2013 gave us great games all around. Shin Megami Tensei 4 is the best game in its renowned series. The wonderful 101 briefly discovered a reason for the Wii U to have a touchscreen. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag remembered that the series was supposed to be vaguely historical, yes, but it was also meant to be fun. Additionally, we had a slew of games that explored some of the industry's most important questions. Bioshock Infinite asked, what if the main character could breathe outside? The Tomb Raider reboot asked, what if the series was good again? Papers Please asked, what if great games could make us miserable? Flappy Bird asked the same question everyone asked about Flappy Bird, and our answer was 17. And this was also the year of Guacamelee, The Stanley Parable, Lego City Undercover, and The Last of Us. However, 2013 was the year that had the largest number of contenders for worst game ever made, with a whopping and reeking five games. Aliens Colonial Marines, Ride to Hell Retribution, Double Dragon 2 Wanderer of the Dragons, and two games that don't have a colon in their title but definitely came out of one. The Connect Kerfuffle, Fighter Within, and the always online disaster piece, Sim City. Then there was the massive disappointment of the Ouya, a crowdfunding success that, in all honesty, seemed poised to do well. The rise of small developers and the rapid embrace of indie games suggested that a console built around those things should have been a hit. And yet, it was the precise opposite of a hit. It was the Ouya. The problem was twofold. First, the fact that indie titles were on the rise proved that they already had distribution on Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft hardware, to say nothing of PCs, and therefore a dedicated console wasn't really necessary. And secondly, the Ouya just wasn't all that great in itself, suffering from poor UI, poor performance, and a poor controller. On the bright side, though, it doubled as an incredibly handy doorstop. Right, okay, I feel better now. My, my heart has frozen over again, just the way I like it. <laughs> Thanks, Ouya. Number 25, 2020. Ah, 2020. A year that basically just happened, but still feels like a lifetime ago. Here's hoping this entry moves a little more quickly than the year actually did. The odds are good that 2020 sticks in your mind as a difficult year for at least one very good reason, and you may actually have dozens of very good reasons. In some ways, however, it was a pretty great year for video games. I suppose it had to be a great year for something, didn't it? The big news was, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, which ruined, well, everything, really, let's be serious. More than six million people have lost their lives to it, and that number is still climbing at time of writing, which is absolutely horrifying. We're only looking at how it relates to video games for this list, however, not to take anything away from the seriousness of the matter, and in fact lockdowns, quarantines, and isolations led to an uptick in industry revenue. One of the world's biggest accounting firms, PricewaterhouseCoopers, estimated industry growth for 2020 at 10%. 
Now, that's bigger than it sounds, as other industries saw sharp decreases in their revenues, such as movie theatres, which plummeted 71%. Simply put, people were buying and playing more games, mostly because they were locked in their houses, and those people were basically just buying and playing Animal Crossing New Horizons, which sold more than 31 million units by February 2021. The safe island paradise of that game arrived at exactly the time that fans needed it most. Also, you haven't been back to check on your villagers since, so I'm sorry to report, they now hate you. This was also the year of great games such as Half-Life Alex, The Last of Us Part 2, the first 0.004% of Final Fantasy VII's remake, and, well, I've also got Cyberpunk 2077 written here, but that obviously belongs in the negatives column. It and Warcraft 3 Reforged duked it out to see who could disappoint the largest number of fans. Let's not forget, though, that COVID-19 also made it difficult for gamers to enjoy the newest releases, as severe console shortages affected the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X S, a problem that's still not fully resolved. Once again, Nintendo's timing couldn't have been better. Having the Switch already on the shelves made it a much easier purchase. This year, multiple stories of sexual misconduct and harassment were also brought to light at major companies and events, including Ubisoft, Evo, and Insomniac. Now, let me be very clear that things being brought to light is an inherently good thing. I wouldn't prefer this was still quietly happening in the background. It does make us feel quite terrible, however, about the general state of the industry and the fact that our money was being given to companies that were treating entire classes of people appallingly. So, on balance, 2020 was dragged down by this news. Number 24, 1992. Nine years after the video game crash, 1992 represents a year in which gaming had finally found its footing a second time. Industry revenue wouldn't match its pre-crash peak until the following year, but things were finally feeling more like, well, an industry again. Games were also being taken more seriously than they ever had before, for better and for worse. Nintendo had ushered the medium into a new era of credibility, Sega was nipping at its heels, which continued driving innovation on the part of both companies, and the entire year was full of true classics from just about every corner. With attention comes controversy, however, and controversy indeed sprung from a pair of games released late in 1992. Mortal Kombat took the sturdy template established by Street Fighter 2 and added the ability to rip your opponent in half with lovingly rendered gore. And Night Trap intended to put the killer in Killer App for the Mega CD, inviting both vampires and murderers into your home in glorious full motion video. But both games horrified parents and politicians who were worried that children would be exposed to all of the same things children had already been seeing in films for decades. It wasn't all scantily clad slaughterhouse fun, of course. Virtua Racing was only horrific if you were afraid of oversized polygons. Kirby's Dreamland was only horrific if you thought about it for a while. And Sonic the Hedgehog 2 was only horrific if you knew that the tendency to introduce new friends for Sonic with each game would eventually give rise to Charmy B. We also saw the release of games that may not have been the first in their genres, but which directly inspired legions of imitators and gave rise to far greater things. Wolfenstein 3D did it for first-person shooters, Dune 2 did it for real-time strategy games, Alone in the Dark did it for survival horror, and Super Mario Kart did it for the end of lifelong friendships. It was a good year. And actually, the controversy that sprung from Mortal Kombat and Night Trap wouldn't really rear its head until 1993, leaving this year to place impressively well on this list. Ultimately, 1992 was when a lot of people took notice of video games, whether that was out of intrigue or fear. The industry earned a lot of new fans, but it would soon also make a lot of enemies. Number 23, 2014. 2014 was a year of significant ups and downs. Whether or not the good outweighs the bad may come down to whether or not you belong to a marginalized group in gaming. 
As we're trying to keep things positive, just know that we've indeed taken the horrendous toxicity that reared its head in 2014 into account, and if you would rank this year lower than we did as a result, we wouldn't blame you at all. Even outside of that, there was plenty to be angry about. Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric in any given year would probably deserve the most venom. Sega entrusted its most valuable IP to a new company, forced that company late in development to aim for a Wii U release, and then rushed that company to finish making it as quickly as possible. The only wise thing Sega did with Sonic Boom was release it in the same year as Dungeon Keeper, which EA published as an exciting new way to get hold of people's credit card numbers. Sonic Boom certainly hasn't been forgotten as the misguided mess that it was, but Dungeon Keeper ensured that Sega wasn't the only company in the crosshairs that year. Which was worse? Well, it depends whether you prefer your game to be crawling with bugs or with microtransactions. There's no right answer. Elsewhere, P.T. was a remarkably confident vision of a horror game that never actually came out. Five Nights at Freddy's was a new kind of spooky experience that wore out its welcome incredibly fast. The Elder Scrolls Online was a huge success that convinced Bethesda to not make another episodic game for years and years, and to instead make an online version of Fallout as well. Good lord, this whole year just gives with one hand and then rips your eyeballs out with the other, doesn't it? But don't worry, there were a few other bits of goodness that didn't come with corresponding horribleness. Alien Isolation was precisely the game that Alien fans always wanted. Shovel Knight would be supported for years with incredible content updates, and South Park The Stick of Truth was one of the most genuinely funny games ever made. Also, Nintendo found success with its new line of Amiibos, little figurines that allegedly could unlock content in various games. We say allegedly because nobody ever took them out of their boxes, so we'll have to just take Nintendo's word for that. Also, Jeff Keighley launched the Game Awards, which quickly became an annual hub of gaming announcements and celebration. Almost as quickly, E3 started dying off, and Keighley soon picked up the slack with Summer Game Fest. I'll give him credit for that, the man's timing really couldn't have been better. Number 22, 1980. With the dawn of a new decade, gaming took a massive step forward. So massive, it might indeed represent the precise year during which gaming could no longer possibly be seen as a fad or a quirky hobby. It was an industry, an art form, and a defining facet of modern life. And we owe all of that to Pac-Man. Pac-Man, like Space Invaders a few years prior, was clearly the best game that had yet been released. It was colourful, addictive, and bursting with personality. It's simple by today's standards, of course, but it remains an enduring favourite thanks in large part to that simplicity. It's deep enough to encourage mastery, yet direct enough that everybody can understand it. The story of a man with jaundice attempting to eat food off the ground before he gets ripped apart by ghosts proved to be urgently relatable to people all around the world, and it gave the industry its first true mascot, who still remains inextricably linked with gaming as a whole. Pac-Man was certainly the biggest success story in 1980, but wasn't the only one. Atari released vector-based tank game Battlezone, which was one of the most visually pioneering games yet. Space Panic is often cited as the very first platformer, even though it doesn't actually feature jumping. That wouldn't become part of the formula until next year's Donkey Kong, which also introduced a replacement for Pac-Man as gaming's mascot. Adventure on the Atari 2600 gave console owners a glimpse at open and world fantasy games to come. Rogue invented a completely new genre that wouldn't truly be appreciated for another few decades, and Mystery House was the first game from Roberta and Ken Williams, who would eventually give the industry some of its most defining graphical adventure games. Oh, and there was new hardware too! Good lord 1980 was busy! Home gamers met the Intellivision, which got its proper launch this year after a small test release in 1979. It was a rousing success and left gamers salivating for whatever console Mattel would produce next. That turned out to be the Hyperscan in 2006 for the record. Yeah, sorry to get your hopes up. Also, Nintendo launched its first hardware success with five varieties of the Game & Watch, shifting around 3 million units and quickly establishing the company as a major force in handheld gaming. And they did it with a game that was just called Ball. Let's see somebody repeat that success today. Number 21, 1990. 
1990 was probably the first truly exciting year for video game hardware. Previous years did see some great and important consoles, to be sure, but they tended to just sort of happen. Rarely did something feel both like an evolution of what we'd seen and an exciting promise of what was still to come. And yet 1990 had two bits of hardware that fit that bill. Nintendo's Super Famicom, known in the West as the SNES, and Sega's Game Gear. In retrospect, the Game Gear fulfilled very little of its immense promise. At the time, though, the idea of a full-colour handheld was an appealing one. Yeah, Atari had its links the previous year, but you probably have gotten beaten up for playing that in public. The Game Gear was much cooler. It wasn't great, it ate batteries like they were sweet, and it would have siphoned its power directly from your body if it could have done, but it was still an important step forward for handheld technology, with games that could have been even better than those on the Game Boy. They weren't better, but they could have been, so, you know, that's something. The SNES, of course, competed directly with Sega's Mega Drive, and helped define the 16-bit era with great games such as Super Mario World and F-Zero. Super Mario World is even the oldest game mentioned on this list to have an average review score of higher than 90%. <laughs> Not half bad, Nintendo. Keep it up, and this Mario guy might actually go places. The NES slash Famicom wasn't quite forgotten about yet either, with Dr. Mario and Fire Emblem becoming landmark titles in their genres. That's puzzle games and hot anime skirmishes, respectively. Arcade games were continuing to experiment and push technological boundaries, with games such as Pit Fighter, which used digitized actors, and Smash TV, which didn't use digitized actors, but was instead good. Then there was G-Lock Air Battle, which had an innovative 360-degree, full 3D world. Lock stood for loss of consciousness, so the game was also innovative for suggesting that playing it could injure you. And PC gamers received some true classics as well, including Wing Commander, Commander Keen, and Railroad Commander. Sorry, Railroad Tycoon. It was also the year of The Secret of Monkey Island, which is often considered the high watermark for graphical adventure games. It's not, of course. That honour goes to its 1991 sequel, in which Guybrush grows a little beard. Still, th this one's alright, I suppose. <clears throat> ben? Number 20. 2006. When you think 2006, you think Wii. Yes, the stinking puddle of rancid Wii that was Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm joking. Seriously, though, the game is terrible. It was Nintendo's Wii, however, that made the biggest impact this year, being the only home console by Nintendo to break the sales record set by the NES. The Wii itself would eventually be unseated as the company's most successful home console by the Switch, but until then, the Wii reigned supreme. It didn't have the greatest specs or most of the best games, but the Wii was less about impressing people than it was about encouraging them to have fun, which it absolutely did. It launched with Wii Sports, which did a perfect job of helping players to understand the appeal of the hardware, and as time went on, the system accumulated a number of party games and fitness apps that made it a must-buy for families and a staple of friendly gatherings. Yes, hardcore gamers had plenty of other places to get their fix, but this was the first time that Grandpa and Little Susie could feel equally comfortable playing the same system and that went a long way towards generating public interest. It was a daring experiment for Nintendo, and it paid off, as it's the fifth best-selling home console to this day. Not bad for a system designed around shaking long, vibrating plastic toys at each other. Actually, maybe I just worked out the appeal. The system released at the very end of the year, so it wouldn't truly start building up its library until 2007. That's okay, however, because plenty of other consoles and developers were keeping us busy with great games. 2006 marked the debut of Bully, Saints Row, The Elder Scrolls, for Oblivion, Gears of War, Just Cause, Okami, Persona 3, and La Mulana. Nintendo's DS got new Super Mario Bros, which, much like the Wii, appealed in particular to gamers who yearned for the days of fun-loving simplicity. It also got Cooking Mama, which single-handedly taught Peter the meaning of the word waifu. The GameCube even got to take a final bow with The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, which also launched on the Wii. It was a great game on both consoles, especially for Zelda fans who always wished that the series would be dark, empty, and miserable. Number 9. 2019. Only four games averaged higher than 90% in 2019, which isn't many, but none of them scored less than 30%, which helps a lot, though we do think that WWE 2K20 probably deserved to. That game's negative reception was so loud that you can still hear the echoes if you close your eyes and concentrate. The game was plagued by glitches, including an amusing one that prevented WWE 2K20 from working once we entered the year 2K20. But let's focus on the positive. Beat Saber gave us one of the best rhythm games ever, Disco Elysium 
Elysium gave us a scummy, gritty mystery to untangle, the reimagined Resident Evil 2 gave us one of gaming's greatest horror experiences, and Sekiro Shadows Die Twice gave me a sadness that is yet to dissipate. Other highlights that we wish performed just a bit better were Control, Outer Wilds, Baba Is You, and Tetris 99. All of that was great, and the year was indeed great, until Google dropped the Stadia, the most recent big flop on our entire list, onto our collective heads like a giant bird poo. If any company had the means to disrupt gaming in a new and exciting way, it was Google. Google instead decided to sink millions of dollars into a system that did not work, and then quickly ignore it and shut down its development studio around 14 months later. Cloud gaming almost certainly will be the way of the future, but the Stadia tried to do too much out of the gate and then gave up the moment that it ran into any difficulty whatsoever. Also, as if to remind us all the downsides of a digital future, Nintendo ceased supporting the Wii Shop channel, and any WiiWare and virtual console games became unavailable from that point forwards. That's unfortunate, of course, but the real problem was that additional shutterings were yet to come, meaning that owners of the DSi, 3DS, Wii U, PSP, Vita, and even PS3 would eventually lose access to their digital libraries as well. Some of those decisions were reversed, for now at least, but digital storefronts are only good for the industry as long as the relevant companies choose to keep them around. The moment they don't, we all lose our games, and that is terrifying. Meanwhile, Microsoft fans who can still download their Xbox 360 games on their brand new Series S are mocking us ruthlessly, and rightly so. Number 18. 2003. After two years of legendary software, 2003 had an interesting idea. What if we kept the great games coming, but also released heaps of terrible ones? The result was, well, a year that wasn't as good overall. And so, admittedly, gamers got plenty of critical darlings and popular favourites to enjoy for years to come. Silent Hill 3, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Beautiful Joe, Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, Beyond Good & Evil, Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne, and even both Wario World and Wario World wear, ensuring that we were boxed in by Wario on both sides, just as we'd always wanted. But the real step forwards in 2003 was the proper standalone release of Steam. Launched by Valve, Steam revolutionised PC gaming, and in many ways, gaming overall. There are valid reasons to criticise the service, yes, but it's much easier to see the benefits that it's brought to gamers and developers around the world. It made it easier for small teams to release their games widely, and it gave indie developers their largest audiences ever. Steam also has a catalogue so expansive that no matter your preferred genre or what you look for in a game, you'll find it here, along with several variants that star enchanted anime bunny girls. Who could ask for any Anything more. Alas, we got more, which drags the average down severely. The biggest hardware flop was the N-Gage, which made the mistake of thinking that anyone would want to play video games on their phones. The idiots! In fairness, it had some big-name game support from the likes of Splinter Cell, Tony Hawk, The Sims, Worms, The Elder Scrolls, Rayman, and Crash Bandicoot. What a lineup! On a related note, what a waste of a lineup! On the software side of the rubbish heap, we had four frequent contenders for the title of worst game ever. There was Big Rigs Over the Road Racing, which broke new ground as a game that had to have the game part patched into it later. Batman Dark Tomorrow and Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness had the innovative idea to turn things that people loved into things that people hated. Then there was Drake of the 99 Dragons, in which you've got 99 dragons, but a Drake ain't one. It took a brand new character that nobody liked and inserted him into a game that didn't function. And it bombed! I swear, gamers are just impossible to please. Number 17. 2009. If you want a year full of great games, well, you could do better than 2009, but still, the games we got were good. Batman Arkham Asylum shocked the world by being a Batman game that didn't make you wish you'd have been gunned down in an alley. It set a new precedent for superhero games, which is good, because the previous precedent was just a paper bag full of dog sick. Elsewhere, Bit Trip Beat combined rhythm action with Breakout, Just Dance got us all up and moving in ways we probably shouldn't have been moving, Demon Souls brought the world one step closer to comparing everything to Dark Souls. The Beat Beatles rock band thrilled those who always hoped to see the band appear in video games, but disappointed everyone who had hoped that John Lennon would have made his debut in a Metroidvania about finding enlightenment. Infamous and Prototype did that Spider-Man pointing at Spider-Man thing before it was cool, and Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors essentially invented escape rooms, weaving a story that you've spent 14 years pretending to understand. The biggest success story wouldn't truly become a success for a while. 2009 marked the first public release of Minecraft. This was also the the year that 
well, a lot of you will hate us for pointing it out as anything other than a negative, but 2009 made the world take notice of phone gaming. There were games available for many years before this, but it's fair to say that prior to Angry Birds, mobile gaming never had a smash success on this level. It was preceded on phones, just barely, by Cannabolt, an endless runner that found itself with an enthusiastic audience of high score chasers, and it would also become a hit. Developers were starting to crack the correct way to make a phone game, and the industry has been more than happy to cash in ever since. This year also gave us a plop trifecta. We got Worst Games Ever Classic, Rogue Warrior, and Future Worst Games Ever Classics, Leisure Suit Larry, Box Office Bust, and Starlin vs Martians. In fact, we will commit to playing both of those games if this video gets to 10 million views. If it doesn't, we'll continue the show and just play something else instead. The stakes are quite low, I admit, but come on, we worked hard on this video, give us 10 million views, please. Number 16, 2012. 2012 has a strong argument for being the overall best year for indie releases. Even if you disagree with that, there's no denying that the year was pivotal in terms of their mainstream acceptance. This year gave us the brilliantly violent and self-critical Hotline Miami. It gave us what might be the cleverest puzzle platformer ever made in Fez. FTL, Faster Than Light, was an anxiety simulator and a great one which puts you in charge of a spaceship and ensures that everything that can go wrong will go wrong at the worst possible time. Spelunky got its first proper public release and made everyone who played it feel like they were very bad at video games, and Retro City Rampage offered pixelised hijinks in a nostalgic NES era style. That's a darned good selection, and large publishers and developers kept us busy as well. Borderlands 2, Dishonored and Spec Ops The Line are all highlights of their genres. Fire Emblem Awakening and Kid Icarus Uprising promised exciting new eras in their respective series, and one of those new eras actually happened. Telltale's The Walking Dead hit new heights in emotional storytelling, and Journey hit new heights in minimalistic storytelling. Also, Gravity Rush is the best game that you will eventually get round to playing one day, you promise. In short, it was a rather good year, but it was marred by one high-profile failure and an easily forgettable one. The most obvious was the Wii U, the 17th best-selling home console in history, which okay, sounds good, but when it's from a company known for rocketing towards the top of that list, that understandably qualifies as a failure. The Wii U had potential that no developers, Nintendo included, seemed interesting in exploring. It set the stage for the far more successful Switch, but at the time, it seemed like Nintendo had lost its magic touch. Then, there was Infestation Survivor Stories. There had been terrible games before, there had been controversial games before, but rarely were games this terrible and this controversial at the same time. The game came under fire for its bugginess, its predatory monetization, features that were held hostage until enough people bought the game, customer info being stolen, a development team that used slurs on official forums, and more. Infestation Survivor Stories probably doesn't deserve a slot on Worst Games Ever, but we'll gladly discuss it if we ever launch a show called Worst Developers Ever. Number 15, 2018. Your personal feelings on 2018 will likely come down to just how much you care about big-budget AAA games, as the real highlights were elsewhere. Of course, we did get a few of those, and what we got was great. Super Smash Bros Ultimate, Spider-Man and God of War took established series and gave us their biggest, most polished games yet. There was also Red Dead Redemption 2, which brought along some controversy about excessive crunch and overworked employees. And overworked employees is not worth a good game, but at least it was a good game. Fallout 76, on the other hand, which launched the same year, had similarly horrific working conditions behind it and was not a good game. It did substantial damage to both the Fallout brand and Bethesda as a whole. If you were open to smaller titles with exciting new ideas, though, then you were better served. Tetris Effect gave us what might be the best version of the game ever. 2018 also blessed us with Moss, Subnautica, Dead Cells, Minute, and Return of the Obra Dinn, all of which provided interesting spins on established formulas, and absolutely all of which are going to be on on somebody's list of favourite games ever. Two releases in particular, Celeste and Iconoclasts, also managed to weave deceptively dense, moving stories that you owe it to yourself to experience. Both games are brilliant, both games are important, and both games prove that even seemingly familiar trappings can pop with new life when there's real passion behind the games being made. Passion is probably the right word to describe 2018, actually. Not all of the games were perfect, and of course not all of them will appeal to everybody, but what was here tended to come from places of love, with real feeling and personal 
personality behind them. Which is why you'd think this would be a great year for something like the PlayStation Classic, but Sony made sure to strip every ounce of love and care out of what should have been an easy home run. It's as though the company tried to provide the worst possible way to experience one of history's most famous game libraries and the mini console justifiably flopped. On the bright side, retailers are still practically giving them away just to get rid of them, and statistically speaking, at least two of your friends know how to hack it. Let them, they'll give you a better product than Sony did. Number 14. 2015. In many ways, 2015 saw us firmly in a new generation of gaming, but you still had to use your hands like a baby's toy. Games were becoming bigger and more spectacular, certainly, but just as important was the fact that they were becoming more moving and more impactful. This willingness to experiment emotionally was on display throughout 2015 in many different ways. It was bleak and contemplative in Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, it was playful and morally challenging in Undertale, it was philosophical and unnerving in Soma, it was full of character and personality in Life is Strange, even at Axiom Verge conceals a story of loss and longing. Games were growing up, in other words. Were there exceptions? Of course! We'll list a few for you right now, as we certainly can't pretend that everything was emotionally charged. Traditional gaming experiences were still everywhere, and they were no less celebrated. This was the year of Fallout 4, The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt, Rocket League, and Bloodborne. Two games released this year do tend to come up in conversations about the worst games ever made, but it's only really fair to count one of them. Alone in the Dark Illumination was, basically, a classic classical bad game. The right kind of bad game. It had big ideas and real ambition, but it bungled them thoroughly, becoming laughable where it should have been terrifying and frustrating where it should have been challenging. We salute you, Alone in the Dark Illumination, as a game that manages to be bad in exactly the correct ways. We do not salute the other one, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, in any way for any reason. It was not a labour of love, it was a desperate grab at some money, as Activision's licensing agreement with the Birdman himself expired at the end of 2015, so they released a product as quickly as possible. I can't even call it a game, because most of the game wasn't ready in time for the release. Players got it later as a massive patch. The disc itself wasn't worth the ink that was printed on it, and Activision tarnished both their own name and the name of a classic franchise for the sake of a few quick bucks. I hope it was worth it, Activision, because you made the worst kind of bad game. The kind without a soul. Number 13. 2007. 2007 is another year that gets by on the overall strength of the games released, and we'll get to those in a moment. Another thing that 2007 has for it is the fact that, well, it didn't really feature any big screw-ups. No major scandals, no massive hardware flops, no industry-shattering legal battles. Any real damage done was temporary and relatively minor, making it far easier than usual to focus exclusively on how healthy things were. Revenue hit 68 billion, a new high, and it would only grow from here. We tried to find something to complain about, you know us. Of course we did, but we had to concede that things were really quite good. 2007 isn't likely to be anyone's favourite year overall, but a quick look back brings a lot of smiles and impressively few grimaces. Console and PC gamers alike received a steady stream of excellent titles such as The World Ends With You, Crackdown, Crisis, Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, Etrian Odyssey, Pac-Man Championship Edition, and Super Mario Galaxy. On top of those, we saw debuts for franchises that would quickly become all-time favourites including Assassin's Creed, Uncharted, Bioshock, The Witcher, and Mass Effect. That's more than enough for anyone, right? And we'd have happily moved along if it weren't for Valve just plopping a whole mess of other great ones into our laps with the orange box. In a gesture of shocking productivity, not to mention generosity, fans received a collection featuring Half-Life 2 and both of its episodes. Nice enough. But it also came with Team Fortress 2, one of the best multiplayer games in history, and Portal, perhaps the very best puzzle game in history. Oh, and PC Game has got an extra playable level for Half-Life 2 called Lost Coast, as well as a Valve-themed reskin of Peggle. On top of all that, Gabe Newell himself would come over and walk your dog three times a day whenever you were on holiday. Okay, that is an exaggeration, but not much of one. We will say that the PlayStation 3 wasn't shifting quite as many units as Sony would have liked. It was the sixth best-selling console of the year, yes, but with only six consoles on the market, that wasn't quite as nice as it sounds. Still, when the worst news of the year is that a very wealthy company made less money than expected, it's hard to feel too down in the dumps. Number 12. 2010. The year we make contact. In other words, the year we… connect? Yes, unfortunately, the world's least beloved peripheral landed with a thud in an otherwise wonderful year. The Kinect isn't just a bad idea, though. It was Microsoft's most public failure, aside from maybe Bob 
Actually, you don't remember, Bob, which probably proves the point. So, what happened? Well, Nintendo had given the world the Wii Remote, which swept popular culture by making gaming more accessible to the lay person. Sony took one look at that and said, I can do the same thing and make it work better. Microsoft took one look at it and said, I can do the same thing and make it not work at all. The Kinect was notoriously finicky, alternating between misidentifying movements and failing to notice them altogether. Admittedly, most of the problems with the Kinect came down to its software, as there's only so much that hardware can do when the games are poorly coded and awfully designed. Regardless, that's the Kinect's legacy. It was a big, expensive add-on that could only play simple games, and it played them all terribly. Literally anyone who was playing their games on something other than Microsoft's newest spy cam, however, was enjoying a seriously excellent year. Fallout New Vegas, Donkey Kong Country Returns, Super Mario Galaxy 2, Blur, Metro 2033, Mass Effect 2, and Red Dead Redemption were all massive, immediate classics. The indie scene gave us Super Meat Boy, Limbo, and Bit Trip Runner. Then there were slow burns like Nier, Xenoblade Chronicles, and Radiant Historia, all of which took some time to find their audiences, but once they did, those audiences were forever grateful. 2010 even saw the debut of two of the most polarizing games ever made, Heavy Rain and Deadly Premonition. Visit the internet for longer than, say, 11 seconds, and you'll see people loudly singing the praises of both at the same time that others are mocking them. The fact that both sides are able to make valid arguments speaks volumes about just how interesting these games are. Only one game released all year failed to break the 30% mark on Metacritic, and that was Decca Sports Freedom. It was a Kinect exclusive, which you probably could have assumed, to be honest. Number 11. 2016. 2016 was a tough year, I think we can all agree on that much, and those of us who attempted to take solace in video games were probably a little disappointed. Yes, of course, there were great games, and we'll get to some of those, but it was overall a rather empty year, full of disappointment and unmet promises. In fact, Unmet Promises was basically a game design philosophy for both Mighty No. 9 and No Man's Sky. In the case of the latter, they simply promised too much and then spent the next half decade trying to make good on things. In the case of the former, they barely promised anything, still came up short, and then declared declared that it was better than nothing. Oh well, at least a new Resident Evil game will make us happy. Oh, oh no, no it won't. At the very least, you were well served if you enjoyed games that are a little more contemplative. Firewatch, Stardew Valley, The Witness, Oxenfree, and one of the best Kirby games, Planet Robobot, go and watch our rank list on all of the Kirby games, all brought a touch of welcome peace and quietude to difficult times. Then again, even Kirby wasn't immune to the frustration, being as his game involved climbing into a gigantic robot and smashing the living hell out of everything around him. Elsewhere, gamers were rightly pleased with the rebooted Hitman, even though Square Enix did everything in its power to make everyone hate it by releasing it episodically and requiring an internet connection for literally no reason. Stop telling us that we need to be online to track our progress, you big liars! Another reboot came with Doom, which was excellent and miraculously tracks your progress just fine without an internet connection. That's a miracle. Right, Square Enix? Uncharted 4 A Thief's End was obviously great, and Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE was both a great swan song for the Wii U and a great way of tiding everyone over for Persona 5. Unless you lived in Japan, where you got both this year, you lucky lucky people. Though Nintendo Switch wasn't out and the echo of the Wii U's death rattle haunted us all, the company itself had a really good year, not least because of two unexpected hits that banked on nostalgia, Pokemon Go and the NES Classic Edition. Both made it clear that everyone still wanted to give Nintendo money, Nintendo just had to, you know, make stuff. Fortunately, they'd realised that for themselves soon enough. Number 10. 2011. This is where the real Dark Souls begins. See? There it is, right there. That alone should make 2011 the number one year on Ben Potter's list of all-time greats, but Mr. Potter is nothing if not humble, so he allowed us to take some other aspects of the year into account as well. <laughs> That's nice. That's unfortunate for 2011, though, because not all of those other aspects were great. In fact, Sony had spent 2010 laughing at Microsoft for fumbling the ball with its Kinect, and then Sony itself spent spent 2011 fumbling its own pair of balls. There might have been better ways to phrase that, but you get the idea. The most notable was the Vita, a genuinely great little handheld that Sony supported and promoted for less time than it's taken me to read this sentence. The 11 years since have been a long, drawn-out death for a handheld that deserved so much better. The Vita even launched the same year as Nintendo's 3DS, which was massively struggling to find its audience, and this was precisely the opening that Nintendo's handheld competitors had been waiting for, but Sony was content to let the Vita starve quietly in the corner. 
Then there was the PlayStation Network outage, which lasted for more than three weeks between April and May, meaning nobody could play their games online. That's all it meant. That was the entire problem. Nothing to worry about at all. Oh, also, 77 million people had their personal information leaked by identity thieves. <laughs> Whoopsie! Yeah, it was a major problem and a huge black eye for Sony. It resulted in legal action against the company and a major investigation. Otherwise, though, there was still plenty to enjoy. 2011 gave the world Terraria, Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch, Rayman Origins, The Binding of Isaac, Bastion, Catherine, Batman Arkham City, Portal 2, Orcs Must Die, and Sonic Generations. The first of several times that everyone would cry, Sonic is good again, before admitting that Sonic was not good again. 2011 was also the year of The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Hopefully you were around to enjoy it then, because I don't think they've ever bothered to re-release this one. Sorry if you missed out. And finally, this is the year that gave us Twitch, bringing gaming into a brave new era in which nobody actually had to play anything themselves. Think of all the time that saved us. Well, not us at Triple Jump, we're, we're streamers, but you guys have benefited, I suppose. Number 9. 2000 in the futuristic year 2000, people expected we'd have flying cars, phasers, microchips in our brain that showed us pretty pictures, and governments that cared about us. Instead, we got the PlayStation 2. And you know what? Fair trade. Sony's second console was by far the biggest news of the year, though it would of course take a bit of time to establish its incredible library and legacy. For now, tentative eyes were on Sony to see if it could maintain its excellent momentum in the console market, or if it would just peter out. I went to school with peter out. The PlayStation 2 is now the best-selling console of any kind ever, so yeah, safe to say they'll be sticking around for a while. The other consoles had their share of great games this year, but Sony was the standout. The original PlayStation had an excellent year, especially for RPG fans. Final Fantasy IX, Dragon Quest VII, and Vagrant Story are highlights of the generation, and the Nintendo 64 got all-time great Perfect Dark, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, and Sumi Tobatsu Hoshi no Keishosha. You probably know that one as Sin and Punishment, but that wasn't until it came to the West in 2007. So for now, it's Sumi Tobatsu Hoshi no Keishosha, and we all have to deal with it. And struggle to pronounce it. PC gamers received The Sims and Deus Ex, and even the Dreamcast, which was not long for this world, got Jet Set Radio and Skies of Arcadia, two games so beloved that Sega refuses to remake them in what we can only assume is some kind of twisted revenge. Things weren't all great, but we can excuse most of the failures easily enough. SegaNet, for instance, was a North American dial-up service established in support of the ailing Dreamcast. It existed for less than a year, lost Sega lots of money, and died an unmourned death. Then there's Mortal Kombat Special Forces, one of the worst games ever made. But everyone is happy enough to pretend it never existed, so it's not like it's bothering anyone. Overall, though, the most important development is that, for the first time, industry revenue exceeded what it had been before the video game crash of 1983. Yes, it took 17 years for revenues to continue upward from where things had left off. To put things into perspective, the crash occurred during the reign of the Atari 2600, and we didn't fully recover until the Dreamcast was on its deathbed. It took a lot of work to turn things around, but we're glad it finally happened. Number 8. 2008 2008 was a boring year. No major hardware launches, no major flops, no industry-shaking scandals, no Yuri Geller suing children's games. Nothing. Revenue was growing steadily, which was good, but hardly noteworthy. 14 games scored 90% or higher, which was about average for this point in time, and only 5 games scored below 30%, which was also average for this point in time. 2008 was just a boring year by the metrics of this list. And yet, maybe that's a problem with us. People look for the peaks and valleys, and don't take time to admire the rolling plains. Those are beautiful too, even if they don't stand out as easily. 
2008 was indeed a beautiful rolling plane, populated by some of the most wonderful games ever made. Braid was intelligent bliss, Valkyria Chronicles combined anime tropes with the horrors of war as well as turn-based combat with a tense third-person shooter. It was a combination that shouldn't have worked, and yet it stands out as one of Sega's crowning achievements. Little Big Planet turned much of the design responsibility over to the players themselves, giving them a creative playground in which to let their imaginations run wild. Bethesda brought Fallout back to life with Fallout 3, a game that blends tragedy and atrocity with a dry wit and brilliant brutality. Then there was a whole load of games that offered… well, nothing is truly perfect, of course, but perfection seems like the only word that feels appropriate. Mega Man 9 brought us retro platforming perfection. Dead Space brought sci-fi horror perfection, Burnout Paradise brought us open-world racing perfection, and Mirror's Edge brought us first-person parkour perfection. Or parkour faction, if you'd like to help me in getting that word to catch on. It was also a very good year for fans of the number 4. Left 4 Dead was Valve's incredible co-op zombie shooter. Grand Theft Auto 4 was Rockstar giving us what we already thought Grand Theft Auto had been like from the start. And Persona 4 is a firm contender for the best JRPG ever made. 2008 didn't even have any of the contenders for worst game ever. In fact, this is chronologically the last year for which we can say that. Every year that followed had at least one. So was 2008 a boring year? Maybe. But if it was, <laughs> long live boredom, am I right? Number 7. 2002 as we'll see, 2001 was a phenomenal year for games, and 2002 retained just about all of that momentum. Great hardware was available across the big three manufacturers, and the quality of the games made it clear that these were exciting times indeed. Bruce Lee Quest of the Dragon, Godai Elemental Force, Legends of Wrestling 2, Sneakers, Gravity Games, Bike, Street, Vert, Dirt, <laughs> classics, all of them. And I think it's safe to say, if you're a gamer today, you have one or all of these games to thank. Anyway, back here in reality, there really were some excellent games released across the board, regardless of what that mountain of plops would have you believe. Xbox fans got Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell and Todd Howard's Morrowind. Sorry, The Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, which set a new precedent for the series, in that every Elder Scrolls game from this point forwards would be called the best and worst in the series in online arguments for years to come, with absolutely no opinions in between. I do so love the internet. Sony fans, especially cartoon-loving Sony fans, were in heaven with 2002's releases. Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, or Sly Raccoon if you want to get European and far less creative about this, boasted some gorgeous animations and an unmatched visual style that still holds up today. Ratchet & Clank arrived on the scene as a great third-person shooter with platformer elements, and the series would go on to teach children around the world about the joy of double entendres. And Kingdom Hearts combined Square characters with Disney ones to forge new ground in impenetrable storytelling. No, I don't understand this series. No, you don't understand it either, so stop lying to yourself. Surprisingly, it might have been Nintendo's struggling GameCube that had the best year for games. All-time greats such as The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, the Resident Evil remake, and Metroid Prime made their debuts, as did flawed but still wonderful releases such as Super Mario Sunshine and Resident Evil Zero. Sadly, nothing was really able to turn that console's fortunes around, but it wasn't for lack of trying. In fact, Metroid fans had their single best year ever, with Metroid Fusion releasing just one day before Metroid Prime in North America. When do you think we'll see two Metroid games in the same year again, eh? I'm thinking 3091 at the soonest. Place your bets now. Number 6, 1996. 1996 is mainly notable for the introduction of one very important piece of hardware, the Nintendo 64. It may not have been able to compete with Sony's upstart PlayStation, but it did have a lot to offer. 
it was 4 player compatible out of the box, it had a thumbstick before the PlayStation did, and its reliance on cartridges may have bitten it in the end, but it also meant that the games loaded with lightning speed and were less susceptible to damage. Nintendo 64 fans also got all-time greats Super Mario 64 and Mario Kart 64, in Japan at least. The thing is though that fantastic games were coming out across the board. Whatever your console of choice, you did have something great to play this year. 1996 gave players Tomb Raider, Crash Bandicoot, Nights into Dreams, Revelations Persona, the first two Pokemon games, Star Ocean and Super Mario RPG. Were you into PC gaming instead? Well, if so, games like Duke Nukem 3D and Quake kept you far too busy to worry about the console wars at all. 1996 also introduced the world to two enduring horror franchises, though they couldn't be more different. There was Resident Evil, which began life as a Doom-like reimagining of Sweet Home. At least until director Shinji Mikami played 1992's Alone in the Dark and said, let's steal that instead. Then there was Corpse Party, which was an atmospheric horror experience that few games have ever come close to matching. Most of the world wouldn't get to play the game until 2008, for now it was a project built in RPG Maker for Japanese computers. Word travelled fast though, and these very humble beginnings spawned a long-running and bone-chilling franchise. And if you like the icing on your cake schadenfreude flavoured, then you're covered there as well. 1996 marked the official discontinuation of some of the worst consoles in history. The Virtual Boy, the Mega CD, the 32X and the Jaguar. Some sources claim the CDI was officially discontinued this year as well, but it seems as though it might have limped on a little longer. Still, I'm happy enough to bury it in the same mass grave, if that's what we all want to do. The 3DO was also discontinued. That wasn't nearly as loathed, but it had struggled for three years before being put out of its misery. Overall, 1996 was a wonderful year, with the industry ushering in greatness and ridding itself of a lot of awfulness. It's hard to complain, really. What was that? Bubsy 3D? No, I never heard of it, mate. Never heard of it. Number five? Number five. Number five! 2005! Anyone with enough money can enter the console market. I mean, look at Soldier Boy. The true mark of success, though, is being able to follow up your first console with another that's worth owning. Nintendo and Sony had both proven themselves by this point, but Microsoft's Xbox could well have been just a lucky accident. The jury was still out. Their second console, however, proved that it was not. The 360 delivered on the promise of its predecessor, and it did so in spades. It had a better controller, superior online functionality, and a much higher failure rate. Okay, yeah, that last one might not be such a good thing, but the console did do remarkably well for itself, and the Xbox Live Arcade ushered in a new era of downloadable titles on consoles, which itself represented a massive shakeup for the industry. Downloadable games were no longer a novelty. From this point forwards, they would quickly become the rule. Another major development for gaming took the form of neither hardware nor software, nor was it a game distribution service or retailer. It was just a website. I'll give you one hint, you're on that website right now. 2005 saw the debut of YouTube which would soon become, among other less positive things, a place for gaming reviews, discussions, walkthroughs, and so on. It broadened the conversation around gaming in general, giving rise to a new era of amateur journalists, and providing a worldwide platform for people to talk about what they loved. I'm joking, of course, everyone complained about everything. Don't worry though, things weren't all great. This was also the year of the Gizmondo, the world's first console that was also a giant scam. If you backed the Intellivision Amico, then you're probably convinced that it wasn't the last, either. On the software side of things, we got Ninja Bread Man and Lula 3D. Fortunately, neither of them was released for the Gizmondo, or the entire planet might have been destroyed in the resulting vortex of awfulness. With the bad games out of the way, though, we can focus on the enormous quantities of good ones that came out in 2005. 
Geometry Wars Retro Evolved, Shadow of the Colossus, Psychonauts, Killer7, and Resident Evil 4 would have been standout games in any year, and brand new franchises got their start here too, quickly earning massive popularity. Yakuza, God of War, Lego Star Wars, Nintendogs, Guitar Hero. We also got the world's greatest soundtrack, which just happened to come with a game, Sonic Rush. What? It's great, I'm dancing just thinking about it, and you would be too, if you had any taste. Number 4. 2004 2004 represented a new era in handheld gaming, due largely to the release of the Nintendo DS, the single most successful handheld console in history. The DS unseated the previous most successful handheld console, the Nintendo Game Boy. The third most successful handheld console, though, is an interesting challenger that might one day overtake it, the Nintendo Switch. They are all currently holding their own against the fourth most successful handheld console, the Nintendo Game Boy Advance. Right, so basically, there's no beating Nintendo here. Nevertheless, 2004 was when Sony decided to strike at them with the PlayStation Portable. It was a good product with a strong library, but it simply could not compete. Nevertheless, the handheld wars were back on, however briefly, and fans of both companies received great games on truly excellent hardware. Another bit of hardware is much more interesting in retrospect than it was at the time, the Atari Flashback. This mini console featured 20 games, was built to resemble a tiny Atari 7800, and had controllers that were similar in style to the originals. Does that sound familiar? This was by no means the first plug-and-play system, but it was definitely the forerunner of later mini consoles produced by Nintendo, Sony, Sega, and others. This was impressively prescient for a company that had long been out of the cultural conversation. That's a lot of good hardware, and we can't even scratch the surface of the important games that 2004 brought us, such as Katamari Damacy, Monster Hunter, Doom 3, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, Andreas, Far Cry, Fable, and Half-Life 2. The most notable title in some circles is one that would only earn wide notice much later. Cave Story, a one-man freeware passion project by Daisuke Amaya that would go on to inspire countless young developers and played no small part in sparking the entire indie movement. There weren't enough true stinkers to make a dent in the year, with only two games hitting our below 30% threshold on Metacritic. Fear Factor Unleashed was actively terrible, but Ping Pals was just pointless. It was a messaging app for the DS, which already had a superior built-in messaging app. Ping Pals also had some mini-games, but it was more of an unwelcome obstruction to your cartridge slot than anything outright appalling. If you do want appalling, though, check out NRA Varmint Hunter, which scored appropriately low, but didn't receive enough reviews to qualify for this list. You are awful, NRA Varmint Hunter, but you're not notable. And you know what? I think that's even worse. Number 3. 1998 one major reason we worked out a scoring algorithm for this list is that, well, something like this list is inherently subjective. We did our best to take our personal feelings and nostalgia out of the overall ranking, because if we relied on those things, we'd never be satisfied. There's always one year that seems like it should be lower, or a year that we personally loved that we think should be higher. We could spend months shuffling everything around without making any progress, and we still wouldn't be satisfied. Everybody will consider different bits of hardware or certain games to be more or less important than others. Some people will see some particular controversy as a genuine tragedy, while others will see it as more of a forgivable misstep. In short, there's no correct way to do something like this. We just did our best to detach ourselves emotionally from the overall ranking and approach each year as fairly as possible. I'm sure you can see we're going somewhere with this, and having said all that, even if we were going by personal feelings alone, 1998 would have to rank extremely high, so we're pretty pleased with this placement all around. On the PC side of things, Baldur's Gate and Grim Fandango remain enduring highlights of their genres, even if the commercial failure of the latter more or less marked the end of its genre. 
This was also the debut of Half-Life, a series which, a quarter of a century later, has yet to give us a part three. It's okay, it's fine, really. It's not that we're impatient, it's just that, you know, we'll all die one day and we'd like to see what Half-Life 3 is like, but, you know, it's fine. Take your time, Gabe. Console gamers had things even better. And you know, when things are even better than Baldur's Gate, Grim Fandango, and Half-Life, you know it was a great year. The best-reviewed game in history, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, set the standard for 3D adventures. Sonic Adventure wasn't nearly as influential, but it was also an impressive step into proper 3D. And Sonic has spent every waking moment since then trying to recapture even a fraction of that game's charm and inventiveness. Metal Gear Solid brought tactical espionage action to the masses with a story that somebody, somewhere, understands. That somebody is called Hideo Kojima, and nobody else gets it. Horror game fans got two of the best ever with Resident Evil 2 and Parasite Eve. And those who loved mascot platformers got both Banjo-Kazooie and S Spiro the Dragon. Yes, am I saying that right? I'm not really familiar, but I, I have heard decent things. Also, Dance Dance Revolution hit arcades and made it abundantly clear how out of shape we all were. What's more, 1998 saw 17 games break an overall review average of 90%, with only one averaging less than 30%. That is the best ratio in the history of video game reviewing, and it goes to show just how spoiled for choice we were when it came to excellent releases. Or it goes to show how few games were getting reviewed by professional outlets. Either would explain it, but we're nearly at the top of the list now, so, you know, let's accentuate the positives, shall we? Number 2. 2017 Some years are able to coast on an abundance of great games, whereas some years are buoyed by a great piece of new hardware. 2017, though, soars this high on the list on the strength of both. The hardware was the Switch, which was everything fans wanted from Nintendo. It was simple, it had a clear USP, and it put the company back in the conversation. In fact, at time of writing this script, the Switch is the third best-selling home console in history. Of course, it's also a portable console, so if we look at it like that, well, it's also the third best-selling portable console in history. That's impressive consistency. Now, not to be cynical, of course, as the Switch does deserve its incredible success, but it remains to be seen how well this approach will serve Nintendo in the long run. In previous generations, their successful handhelds kept the company flush with money while their less successful consoles struggled. Will eliminating the division between handheld gaming and home gaming work for them or against them? We'll find out eventually, but for now, the Switch was very clearly the right move. Then there are the games. Oh lordy, the games. Cuphead was the perfect realization of an incredible artistic vision. Little Nightmares was a perfect atmospheric puzzle platformer. What Remains of Edith Finch and Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice duked it out to see which could provide the perfect emotional experience, and they each took such different approaches that I'm comfortable in declaring them both winners. Super Mario Odyssey has a damn strong argument for being one of the best 3D platformers ever made. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild set a new high watermark for open world adventures. Neo Automata combined heavy philosophizing with hot anime robots, just as I'd always wish somebody would. Sonic Mania gave us the game we always wanted from the series, and Resident Evil 7 Biohazard gave us the game we never knew we wanted from its series. And we're still just scratching the surface. Horizon Zero Dawn launched an exciting new franchise, Hollow Knight did Metroidvania better than Metroid or Castlevania ever will, and A Hat in Time was the rare indie game with retro sensibilities that actually actually fully lived up to its promise. We got Doki Doki Literature Club, Prey, and Night in the Woods as well, all of which are rich and interesting enough that we could talk about them for full entries on their own. There were so many incredible games this year, in fact we counted 18 of them as being landmark titles. That's more than we counted for any other year, and for such a recent year that's a massively reassuring thing to see. 2017 also saw the debut of Player Unknown's Battlegrounds and Fortnite Battle Royale. Do we love those games? 
well, no, not really. But do lots and lots of other people have lots and lots of love for those games? Oh, absolutely. Also, they've made more money than you can even dream of. And I know you, you can dream of a lot of money. As a result of all this, 2017 understandably came very close to nabbing the top spot. But one other year just managed to squeeze past it in our rankings. Ben? Number 1. 2001. Here it is, the best year in gaming. 2001 saw the console debut for Microsoft, and though the 360 might have become the bigger hit, the Xbox was no slouch. It managed to make an impressive impression, even when up against a long-loved Nintendo and fiery upstart Sony. Microsoft, of course, clearly had the money to prop up the console and could have bought as much advertising as they liked, but as later experiments have proven, Google, cough, cough, that's not enough to make people actually want your hardware. Instead, the Xbox succeeded thanks to an exciting new exclusive, Halo. The Xbox also included online gaming capabilities, correctly sensing that it would be the wave of the future and impressing gamers who couldn't help but agree. Sega, meanwhile, gestured with with futility at its online-friendly Dreamcast, which had just spent several years famously bombing. Speaking of which, Sega bid farewell to the Dreamcast and the console market at large, putting a button on everything with Sonic Adventure 2. The same year, Sega ported it to Nintendo's GameCube, ending gaming's longest rivalry. They also released Sonic Advance for the Game Boy Advance, which displayed impressive business sense from Sega because they'd finally published a new game on a piece of hardware that people actually owned. Elsewhere, the PlayStation 2 was on fire. No, not literally, that was the Xbox 360 many years later, with a slew of brilliant games. Fans got some of the best sequels in history, with Silent Hill 2, Grand Theft Auto 3, Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty, and Final Fantasy X, as well as exciting new series such as Max Payne, Devil May Cry, Fatal Frame, and Jack and Daxter. If you enjoyed video games at all, the odds were very good that the PlayStation 2 had something you wanted. That leaves us with Nintendo, which launched its GameCube and, well, it wasn't the hit console that the company needed, to be honest. They supported the system with some great games, such as Animal Crossing, Pikmin, and Luigi's Mansion, but none of them established the GameCube as a must-have. However, Nintendo also launched the Game Boy Advance, one of the greatest handhelds ever. This established a new place for Nintendo in the industry. It may not have been able to compete directly in terms of hardware anymore, but it could find different ways of bringing content to gamers. Nintendo was no no longer gaming's guiding patriarch, but it was happy enough to become its very creative, fun-loving uncle, and the company has leaned into that image ever since. In short, 2001 set the precedent for what gaming looks like today, more than 20 years later. Sony and Microsoft are still going head-to-head -head in battles over hardware specs, with the former having more homegrown exclusives, but the latter leading the way in online offerings. Nintendo is still serving as the inventive outlier, finding new niches in which to flourish while its competitors fill the more traditional spaces. This is still the configuration that dominates the industry today, and these three companies have held that arrangement for a longer period than any other set of competitors ever have. This incredible year also gave us a frankly insane 32 games that average 90% or higher, more than any other year. And whereas the year 2000 exceeded the previous revenue peak of the industry pre-crash, 2001 continued the upwards trajectory, signalling that the industry hadn't just had a pretty good year at the turn of the millennium, but that the industry had indeed been fully reborn. If you enjoy anything about gaming today, you owe it to 2001, which put everything on stable footing again and did so with exciting new hardware, a new set of companies at the top, and some of the best games ever made. If you were around in 2001, I hope you enjoyed yourself. It's not likely that we'll see a year like it ever again.